A conference for Africa, specifically it's supposed to be a practical and devices solutions conference for Africa. This is a fifth year in running, as uh, stated by uh, Mrs. Isang, and uh, we are thrilled. We're thrilled that uh, you're able to join in front. We're, we're thrilled that you're able to join us today. This was cool. Okay. Um, the uh, and the Vasa Conference Solutions for Africa started five years ago as a, as a way to uh, start. In the in the in the, in the Vasa Revolution of the years, over the past thirty five to forty years, where in the Vasa surgery had taken root in uh, most uh, advanced countries uh, and uh, in other continents. Uh, we just have not had the pleasure to, uh, to have go along with the rivals that uh, other countries have. Uh, and the vast of technology is quite advanced in Europe, in, uh, in Asia, some parts of uh, South America, America, and, um, and uh, Australia. Africa indeed has really lagged behind. Our goal in bringing this conference to you at no cost is to increase our awareness of Indivasa solutions uh, that we can offer our fish center in Nigeria and uh, broadly in Africa. If we don't know that Indivasa solutions, healthcare practitioners would not uh, provide that option to the patient. So our, our goal is to have a practical session today. We have a great group of speakers from around the world, uh, from London, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, multiple cities in the United States, and uh, many per, uh, uh, great uh, surgeons here in Nigeria who would be giving us uh, great talks on some areas of cardiovascular uh, inventions that they could currently do in their own practices. Uh, so we're thrilled also to uh, uh, have this, uh, this program today, primarily sponsored by Duchess International Hospital, uh, which is uh, Vibram CEO of this, uh, Chidabay, who has been quite helpful in making sure that um, the hospital's positioned in reverse medical tourism. Uh, we all know that uh, medical tourism is a big uh, no way other parts of the Middle East to access the health care. Sometimes for no reason uh, because they have they can afford it. Uh, the bigger issue is. How can we bring in the vast of technology and also reverse medical tourism in Nigeria and make it affordable? Uh, one way for us to do that is to uh, first uh, create an awareness uh, of, of the problem and also seek solutions uh, to, to uh, improve the problem. Solutions can be obtained or, or, or gotten if we, uh, if we get a group of like minded individuals who are uh, in the vast of client and also uh, bring other physicians who are not in the vast of frames but have interest in the vast of surgery. We certainly can bring them aboard and uh, teach them the judgment and skill sets necessary to safely perform in the vast of inventions. So that is the ultimate goal of uh, the conference, with the biggest impact being the uh, creation of. Uh, of uh, in the vast potential of our patients here in Nigeria and Africa at large. Uh, so, without further ado, 
Uh, once we get started, we'll, our next speaker would be the CEO of uh, Duchess International Law School in this issue today. And uh, prior to just coming on, I can also tell you that uh, we're, uh, we're building a collaboration uh, with uh, all uh, physicians and uh, generally the generalists uh, and specialists and all areas to push the international envelope in Africa with particular reference to Nigeria. I'm passionate about this topic. So that's why I made the trip to me to come to Nigeria to ensure that we do this. I'm passionate about this because I don't want people who do not live when they don't know who When we have doctors here in the And, um, uh, and then be, be appropriately worked out for potential kidney transplant, which is the best solution for them without going through shady ways to authenticate this. I'm passionate about this also because we have to limit the, uh, uh, the stroke uh, issues in Nigeria, particularly in Germany and in continent. Stroke is a major problem. Uh, the access, developing good ways to uh, uh, strategies to improve that stroke time intervention will be critical. So this conference also would uh, provide speakers at uh, who in our country today, we're having persons have heart attacks and die from heart attacks. And uh, the average person would say they're being uh, cursed by juju or whatever we call it, but the case where beginning to leave uh, uh, in, in the continent of Nigeria, where the lifestyle speed concludes, and we have disease process that mirror what we have in, in Western countries now. So people do have those issues, and will not have those issues. Our um, goal is to make sure they know when they are afflicted or have symptoms, they know where to uh, seek help, and hopefully the help they seek will be adequately provided when they seek this help. Uh, so again, um, when they have renal problems and they have renal know where to go, strokes and all. So limb loss is a big issue. I believe in limb preservation as an as endovascular surgeon. So translate that uh, skill set to uh, Nigeria. Uh, yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll just wait a little bit and get Mr. Shidebe to come on and uh, he'll get started uh, with his talk, reversing that book tourism in Nigeria. And Africa as a whole. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome our first speaker for this occasion, uh, Mr. Shilabe, uh, the CEO of uh, Duchess International Hospital. He's well trained first. Uh, uh, as a physician, I uh, is uh, boarded uh, in general uh, medicine in the UK and uh, been uh, active as uh, CEO here in uh, Nigeria with excellent uh, uh, CEO qualities. Uh, Grace us with this uh, wealth of knowledge when it comes to. Uh, uh, steel related issues and particularly reversing that with tourism um, opportunities here in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ian. Um, where would you like me to stand? Uh, right, take okay. it. There's no, no need for my question, sir. No, right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to. Can you hear me all right? It's a, a great pleasure to. Uh, what was that? That's it. Right, where would you like me to stand? Stand here. New It's a very new world. All right. Um, uh, my special thanks to uh, the organizers of this, this great conference of the public you who have had the pleasure of knowing for. Well, at least a few months. His input here at the Duchess has been quite significant. 
Um, so I've been asked to speak um, briefly, and will be brief, on the subject of reversing medical tourism. Um, of course, this is a conference that is focused on um, endovascular solutions in Africa. So what we're trying to do really is, is make these tried and trusted uh, systems and treatments feasible in this environment. Um, that in itself is a statement um, on the subject of innovation. So the, the, the key issue that confronts us, therefore, is how do we go about um, in So here at the Duchess International Hospital, we speak in terms of uh, what we call access to affordable world-class healthcare. Um, and what that means really is um, that our task, the task that confronts us really is to ensure that we lower the barriers, we bring down those barriers that prevent people, um, again that word, accessing the, the level and the quality of healthcare that we believe that Nigerians uh, deserve. Um, so our mission is to reverse medical tourism, and that happens to be the subject of my talk, by delivering the high standards of care, using the most advanced technology and treatments to give our clients the fastest, most convenient, to get that word access to the best medical um, expertise available anywhere in the world. So that's a very good place to start. Um, what does that actually mean? reversing medical tourism. It, it's difficult to consider the subject without considering the reason we are happy to attempt to reverse medical tourism in the first place. So let's, let's look um, a bit at the landscape of where we are and how we got here. So I try to describe this really in considering these issues. Um, the, the key thing is that there is a crisis of trust. Is there not? Uh, when we think about the reasons why people are deciding, electing to go abroad. And by the way, in this economy, that represents a, a whopping 600 billion naira, about 1.2 um, billion US dollars a year. That's written in context of about 50, um, 60,000 Nigerians every year spending approximately $20,000 uh, each. Now, what's the reason that Nigerians are deciding? And this is just not. Uh, Sub Saharan Africa just yet. What are the reasons that Nigerians are deciding that they want to do this? Individuals, um, there are many people who would say that healthcare is a fundamental public good. So individuals, of course, have the right to seek those opportunities wherever they may find them. So let's consider some of the reasons why some of people are deciding to go abroad. Um, we are seeking good governance, clinically and administratively. We are seeking high quality care delivered by world class consultants. Okay. We're seeking the practice of medicine in an environment that has a proper regulatory control. So, the policy environment, the regulatory environment under which we practice must be optimal. Okay. And we are seeking an environment in which our doctors, our nurses, our allied healthcare professionals are happy.
as well. So what must we do? What must we do, therefore, in order to stem this hemorrhage? Okay, we must begin to focus on those things that our patients actually want. Delivering access to affordable world-class healthcare. What does that mean? It really must be in this environment to be codified. It means good quality treatments, whatever it takes to get that to our patients. Okay. Over the next couple of days. Okay. Whatever it takes to get this.
We have a written email letter because I'm ready to kick him off. Is this not Kerry's clothes? She wants to wear that she was sitting on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Close the door. Let her dress up. Close the door. Yeah. Hello, Sita. I said Jesus. Yes. Oh, God. Yeah, I'll write it. I'll write a letter now. Uh, if you are going to send him a letter, it's going to be on probation for the next ninety days. Any other mishap is done. Is done. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is a what this is a thirty-something-year-old person, right? That's with uh, acute cholecystitis. But, but when did Atalabi call you about it? Just now, just today. And uh, was an excellent master surgeon and also was an excellent innovator. Indeed, when you do chronic surgery and you open the chest, that usually was uh, instrumental to the. Uh, Fragrant cholecystitis, not just cholecystitis. Yeah. So that's uh, one of the things that wow, Dr. Hughes was known for. He was an excellent in the master surgeon, quick hands, uh, and also uh, was very uh, inventive. And his uh, thinking uh, was uh, the first person physician that is to start the outpatient primary vascular cath lab process that we see today. Uh, Dr. Dietrich, unfortunately, uh, died in 2017 from uh, uh, brain cancer. And uh, the legacy has left behind over the years after uh, Jean Boivon. Dr. Dietrich trained many of us. Uh, in Africa, two doctors, particularly that were trained by Dr. Dietrich, but one of the speakers today, Dr. Hopper uh, from Senegal, Tahar, and Dr. Muhammad, is, uh, uh, Muhammad is also a guy from Dakar, both trained under Dr. Dietrich. I have the distinct left office trained under him, and uh, others from Australia, uh, and the United States, Europe, uh, Asia. Dr. Dietrich was just a great personality. So uh, we're proud that we're able to at least get back to the vision of the master and uh, awareness in the world. And with this uh, input to that, we got in such an early age where he was able to uh, make travel fellowship uh, for physicians to come to the African Heart Institute. Uh, I think uh, it's phenomenal. And our goal also is to now and bring others uh, along the way 
those that have interest in plastic surgery can make the area can also seek uh, such help. We also have at the front the International Society of Endovascular Specialists, uh, which uh, was also a society that was also founded by Dr. Dietrich. And uh, the current president of the society, Dr. Uh, Rania Braventa, cardiac surgeon, trained, uh, currently working in Texas, Houston, um, Villa. And um, she will be giving us a keynote address sometime tomorrow. And we also have a uh, current president, uh, incoming president of ICDS, Dr. Thomas Shaw. Uh, she'll be talking to us also, I believe, tomorrow uh, on interesting topics too. So uh, we're looking forward to an exciting conference, and uh, we look forward to having our next speaker, Dr. Dr. Buddy Palachin. Kingdom, where he uh, finished his uh, cardiovascular training and uh, came back to uh, Lagos and currently works at Lassus. And uh, he's uh, here to give us a talk specifically titled Open Heart Surgery in Nigeria Insights from the Nigerian Open Heart Surgery Registry. Dr. Palashin, thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good afternoon. I mean, good morning. Good morning. Okay. I will just share my slides. Um, bear with me. Not too familiar with um, Teams. I keep on using Zoom. Um, that's the share tray. And control. Okay. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, lovely. Okay. All right. Um, I just want to talk briefly about open heart surgery in Nigeria and introduce you to our national registry, which is the source of all the data that we're talking about and which will give you a feel for what's going on in Nigeria right now with um, open heart surgery. So I'm presenting on behalf of the Open Heart Surgery Registry collaborators, all listed. They're from the 17 um, institutions in Nigeria that are contributing data. And this registry is supported by our National Association of Cardiovascular and Plastic Surgeons in Nigeria, as well as the Nigerian Cadet Society. And we launched the registry in September 2020. The registry is internet-based, it can be accessed by any device that has data, whether PC, tablet, or phone. Um, that's the website, which I would encourage you to look at. I would give you a few snippets from the website. I can't go through everything, but just enough to let you know what we're doing. Um, it is, um, it is um, designed by me. I use a, a database engine called um, Caspio Bridge, and it is funded. It is funded by Edward Stack National and Edward Slice. There's, there's a lot of background I wonder if we could, we could mute those who aren't talking. It's better. So it is funded by an educational grant by, by Cardio Stack International, who are based in the States, and Edwards Life Science. They've paid for a year so far, and it has been renewed once, and we hope that they'll continue to renew. But we are looking for more sponsors so we can keep on this registry. So what's the purpose? To have voluntary data on heart surgery in Nigeria, so we can build up a registry of, of, of activity. And this will help us to make our practice um, evidence-based, driven by a robust registry of our activity. There are currently 17 contributing institutions um, all listed here in the public sector and private sector. We have six public sector institutions and 11 private sector institutions that are currently contributing data to the National Registry. So we decided on a minimal data set as listed, age, sex, gender, diagnosis, the risk score, the operation dates, operation, the findings, a brief operation description, 
bypass and cross-line times, temperature, paraplegia, complications, and outcome. For a cardiac database, the data set is much more robust, much more wider than this. But this is an early database. It is essentially done by us. So, you know, busy surgeons. So the idea is to spend a minute or less to enter the data. So we just picked a few minimal data sets, which will expand over time. So these are snapshots of what it looks like on your phone on the left and PC on the right. And I'm going to take you through uh, various fields in the registry. So this is what our registry looks like. We have a home page where to get surgery has all these tabs listed. And I'll take you through one by one. So cost of surgery. Um, in last tooth, we have a billing manager which we designed which helps us to know the cost of surgery. We cost everything. So the anesthesia pack, blood products, hospital fees, ICU pack, provision pack, theater pack. And as you can see, we list the item, supplier, what the cost is, how many are required, and the time at which the cost was accurate. So you can see that these are all um, recently updated in um, August. So the current price for mitral valve replacement, which is our benchmark surgery, is um, 3.5 million in the public sector. It is obviously higher in the private sector, but this gives you a benchmark and people can then build on, you know, add their own markups, their own costs and everything. So this shows our registry data from January 2004 till October 2022. So far, there are 882 cases on the registry. You can see that the activity has grown from 2004 um, to date, and there are now, as I said, 17 institutions contributing data. This is um, the same information in a tabular form. So you can see the various institutions on the left and the yearly activity and contributions, totaling 882 cases. So this graph, so this um, pie chart is a breakdown of the activity across all the contributing institutions. Um, the primary contributor has been the Tri-State Group. They have done 40% um, of the cases so far in the country, followed closely by IFE and Nasuth. They have done 12.8%. Then first cardiology, just under 12%. And then you have all the other institutions that also um, contribute. This is the activity so far for this year. Um, 170 cases so far, um, divided up between the Tri State Group in Lekki, the Tri State Group in Babcock, IFE, First Cardiology, Lasus, De Marine Okusu Memorial Hospital, um, um, Evercare Hospital, FMC Abuja, Regent Stroke, Booth Cardiac Center, Dr. Jomilo Center. This graph shows us the monthly activity over the last five years. This shows that the average is that every month about 15 cases are being done across the country. Not huge numbers yet, but what this does show is that there is regular activity. And as I've shown in the previous graph, this that activity is gradually um, building up. So that's very encouraging. This shows the spread across the institutions of adults in blue and pediatric activity in green. You can see that the Triaxid group does both pediatric and adults. The IFA group focuses largely on pediatric. In last week, we focus on adults, first cardiology, um, adults, and the other institutions, a mixture of adults and pediatric. So overall, um, between 2004 to date, you can see that blue is adults, green is pediatrics. Things started off largely with an adult surgery, but now it has progressed where they have about 50% adults and 50% pediatric activity done in the country. And this is shown in this pie charts. Um, adult cases is 55% and pediatrics um, 45%. This shows the distribution of adult cases. The most common cases are cabbage, matter valve replacements, mechanical, um, ASD repairs, um, aortic valve replacements, mitral valve replacement, the tricuspid repair, 
And interestingly, quite a few technology of fellows, we get uh, uh, about 20% of our cases, adult cases are congenital and technology of fellow upstarts. So this shows the distribution of all the adult cases. Single vowels, about 32%, cabbage, 20%, congenital, as I just said, um, 20%, double vowels, and some other cases. We also have um, surgery on the ascending aorta, being about um, 7%. So we have a wide spectrum of cases being done in the country. Looking at the single vowels, we use mainly mechanical vowels, um, 80%. Uh, and repair about 10%. So because it's mainly, mainly rheumatic disease, infective, we, we aren't really able to save uh, most of the valves. So most valves get replaced with the mechanical prosthesis. And we have a young patient population, unlike the Western world, where the valve surgeries are being done in the older population. <clears throat> this shows the pediatric cases. Um, most common cases are teratology or phyllo, VSD repair, AV septal defect, and ASD. Those are the, the commonest. So it's commonest to TOF and VSD. And this just was the same information as the pie chart. Um, TOF, VSD repairs, AVSD, VSD repairs, and a whole range of other cases. I mean, we've been doing um, tronchosatoriasis correction, um, arterial switch. So there's a lot of surgery going on in the country. And this shows overall, for both adults and um, pediatric, the breakdown of the type of cases being done. So because we have a lot of adult congenital, the congenitals overall are about 55%. And that, that's then followed by um, single vowel surgeries, cabbage, and other cases. Um, outcome data, this is with a pinch of salt. This should be risk um, stratified. But we should always know, track our, our outcomes. You, as you can see below here, the numbers on which the outcomes are based. So if you have small numbers, losing one or two patients pushes up the mortality. So this is still very early data. But at least as a benchmark for now, you can see that our single valve mortality is about 6.7% and cabbage about 9%. So, this to me is the most interesting slide. Who is doing the cases? The local teams or visiting teams? As with many other countries, we started off with CADAC missions. So in blue are the visiting teams. But there's been a rapid progression whereby the local teams are now doing most of the surgeries. And you can see here that overall, the local teams in Nigeria, between the different institutions I showed you, are doing about 70% of the cases and visiting teams about 28%. We have something called the um, activity locator. This allows you to search by procedure, operational diagnosis. So say you're looking for where in the country can I get a tetralogy of fallow done. You type in tetralogy of fallow and it tells, it shows you that IFE has done 30, Tri-State in Bangkok has done 70. Be able to decide to refer the patients. So it's, it's, noise. So in summary, we now have an online open heart surgery registry, which is very easy to um, input data with minimal fields. Currently, 17 institutions are converting data to us. The data we have so far shows that there's been a rapid growth of heart surgery in the last five years in the country, and it is still growing. And there's a wide range of both adults and pediatric surgery available in the country by um, resident teams. So, Traveling out for open heart surgery, as Dr. Shishidabe said earlier, and the Herberts, this is only if patients choose to do so. It's not a necessity as many years ago, because open heart surgery is widely available and is much more affordable than traveling out of the country. We still have a few challenges. Not everyone's not everybody is contributing data, so we're still working on convincing more colleagues to contribute data to make our registry even more representative of our national practice. There's also the costs. Um, for now, it is maintained by Edward Life Science and Cardiostats. It costs about $4,800 per annum, and we're seeking more funding to be able to continue this registry. So the journey continues. Thank you very much.
stop the slideshow. Hello. <sighs> this IT is terrible. Looks like we're having IT issues. Yeah, yeah it looks like it. we're almost there. Right? Give us a few more seconds here. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And can, can, can you see my screen? You can see yes. your slides, yes. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Hamed Minolo. I'm a vascular and interventional radiologist. I'm just going to show, um, uh, it's a 20 minute talk, so <clears throat> decided to show, show kind of showcase some of the endovascular work that we're doing here in Nigeria. Um, so uh, this is a case of a 36 year old female with a history of um, end stage renal disease who was uh, previously on uh, hemodialysis for two years and uh, ended up having a, a uh, left brachial, uh, brachial basilic fistula uh, placed by Dr. Sanusi, I believe, and um, ended up uh, with arm swelling um, immediately, essentially after the, the fistula um, um, placement. Um, we initially saw her right after the fistula placement with arm swelling, and uh, we counseled her at that point uh, about endovascular recanalization because she had had a CT scan that was showing that the subclavian vein, which is here, was completely occluded. Uh, however, she declined uh, to have a, an intervention at that time. She did have a history of prior swellings in the arm and neck uh, from uh, before when she had uh, venous catheters put in, uh, but those were eventually taken out. Anyway, she kind of walked around for about eight months and the swelling got progressively worse uh, to the extent that it became a significant detriment on the quality of her life. So we brought her into the cat lab and uh, we went in just like we would traditionally go in. We went through the fistula, uh, the venous outflow of the fistula, and we saw this obstruction. Uh, we spent about two to three hours in the cat lab at that time trying to cross this obstruction. Uh, usually what we would do is try to cross it with, a, with the aid of a glide wire and a catheter. And we also have things like sharp recanalization techniques that we will use in some cases, like using the back end of a glide wire, using a, a RF or using laser to try to cross these uh, lesions. However, when we looked at the CT scan for her uh, carotid artery, our left carotid artery was crossing this area. So we elected not to try sharp recanalization techniques. So essentially we failed to cross. And then we had uh, conferences with both uh, vascular surgery and cardiothoracic surgery. Uh, so what the options were for her, and uh, I talked to Dr. Madu, who was in the UK in vascular surgery, who said uh, at that point that the options for her surgery-wise were basically significantly limited and uh, would, would require a significant uh, morbid surgery. Uh, same thing with cardiothoracic surgery, said the options were very limited for her. Uh, so we, at, uh, we, at the time of this procedure, we also uh, went into the right arm and came from the, from the right side and came through the brachycephalic vein on the right side. Uh, to basically see what was going on on the left brachycephalic vein, and that was widely patent here, which is demonstrated here. This vein is actually not the jugular vein. It's basically a 
a large collateral from the jugular venous arch that's basically become enlarged and replaced the jugular vein because the jugular vein was essentially occluded in her. Um, so we uh, had a long conversation with the patient, had a long multidisciplinary meeting, and uh, basically there were no surgical options. But I've seen this paper for that some, um, some of our colleagues in the US just started doing something called percutaneous extra anatomic uh, venous bypass, where essentially uh, without surgery, they were bypassing patients with stent grafts uh, through subcutaneous tunnels, um, especially patients that had occlusion in the region of the costal clavicular junction. Uh, essentially because of the bone and what they were doing was bypassing from the axillary or the subclavian vein um, into the internal jugular vein and they've had they've had a uh, very significant success with that. So we counseled the patient appropriately um, at this time, you know, we'd never done one in Lagos, so I recruited uh, uh, Dr. Sutene, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon from, from Lassut, who came in uh, to help me out with the procedure at Eurocare. Uh, some of the considerations um, for this procedure was that, you know, the, the vein was arterialized, so the risk of bleeding was very high, and also the fact that, you know, the vein was occluded, so there was significant venous hypertension, and we were worried that we would not be able to control uh, significant bleeding if that happened. Anyways, uh, this became a, a, a three to four hour debacle, but we ended up getting it done, and I will just explain how we did the procedure. The first thing we did was we got access, anti-grade access um, in the fistula distally in the arm and, and brought a, a wire this way uh, from the arm. The next thing we did was basically punctured the axillary vein from the retrograde access and put basically, we now had through and through access. We put a wire into the axillary vein going to retrograde and brought our wire out uh, from the anti-grade access in the, in the arm here. Now we had access basically from the arm into the axillary vein. The next thing we did was we basically punctured the brachycephalic vein and that big jugular venous vein that was coming up. And basically that junction of the brachycephalic, left brachycephalic vein and the jugular venous arch vein that was coming up, we punctured that with a micropuncture access and we got access into the subclavian, uh, into the superior vena cava. Now, basically the obstruction now is from here where we got access to here and this is where we need to bridge. So basically we brought our access out from here through a tunnel and took it into here and basically now, when, once we're done, we have through and through access, basically from the arm, through the subcutaneous, uh, to the occluded vein, through the subcutaneous tunnel, into the brachycephalic vein. And, and once we had this access, basically the, the job uh, became a little bit easier. Uh, the next thing was we basically got a 12 French sheet, which we pushed through the uh, occluded vein, through the uh, subcutaneous tunnel, and into the, into the superior vena cava which was a nine French sheet. And then we deployed a viabond stent graft. Uh, we initially deployed a, a viabond stent graft in the, in the distal access. Um, we, we usually, we, we initially used a nine by 15. Uh, the way into the axillary vein, oh, something just happened. One second. Okay, and, and extended it all the way to the axillary vein. And as you can see on the completion venogram here, uh, when we inject this vein, there's basically blood basically flowing through this viable stent graft um, into the subcutaneous tunnel uh, stent graft and into the superior vena cava. And you can see basically this is the pre procedure where you see that she has significant debilitating arm swelling uh, pre procedure. And this was clinic one week later where her arm swelling was significantly reduced. Uh, she still obviously has, has the aneurysm from the fistula, but uh, uh, our quality of life after this procedure was significantly improved. And this was the first time we tried this in our environment um, as an operator. Uh, just moving on to what we did uh, with aortic cases uh, during the, the COVID period, we started our, our endovascular uh, aortic interventions during the COVID period. Again, this is something we did not have a significant amount of experience in, but we did have a significant amount of collaboration between multiple centers, uh, multiple specialties, specifically cardiothoracic surgery uh, and interventional radiology and anesthesia. This was our first case with Dr. Sanusi, uh, where we had a 53-year-old gentleman at that time who had a 7.5 centimeter aneurysm and a type B dissection um, of the aortic arch. And at that time, we knew that the dissection uh, flap um, was too close to the, uh, to the uh, left subclavian uh, artery. And the patient also needed a, a left carotid to subclavian bypass. And as you, you would see here uh, on this video, this is um, 
basically our deployment of the stent graft at the first time, but after deployment of the stent graft, and I'll show before and after um, venograms here. So basically, I'm sorry, arteriograms. This is uh, the arteriogram before deployment of the stent graft. You could see um, uh, the dissection flap here uh, with a big aneurysm coming from uh, the descending aorta. And this is after deployment of the stent graft and placement of the uh, left carotid to subclavian bypass. You could see that we've essentially excluded that large aneurysm sac and, um, and was able to uh, get this patient better. The patient ended up having an endo leak from the subclavian artery. So I did come from the right, uh, left radial uh, artery to place some coils here uh, about um, a month later, and it's still doing very well. We keep, we're still following them up. Uh, this is just another case of a, this is, I think, our second case. Of a, of a T var that we did with a descent naota again with a dissection ex, um, from the uh, beyond the subclavian artery. In this case, the dissection, we had enough room to land a stent graft without having to do a bypass. And this is our first case of, a, of an E var that we did. This was all the way in Abwad in uh, Akiti, um, where we, we were able to uh, place a trouser graft in this patient. And again, uh, this patient was followed up and doing very well. And I believe this is the CT scan. This is CT scan uh, a year after uh, this EVAR. And as you can see here, the stent graft is nice and patent, um, and we do not have uh, an endo leak. And we continue to try to collaborate on uh, treatment of these patients with uh, aortic pathologies. Unfortunately, a lot of the patients that we see in our environment with aortic pathologies are not uh, candidates for endovascular techniques, and some of them are very high surgical uh, risk patients, uh, but we, we keep going into trying to find our patients that are candidates and we can intervene on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hamed. Thank you so much. Any questions for Dr. Hamed? Questions from the audience? Yes, uh, on, on the uh, David Mistler case that you did, you said you used a case for the Eight by five viable. Would that be? No, we use a nine by fifteen viable stand graph. Sorry. Nine by fifteen. Nine, nine by fifteen. Okay. Uh, did you consider using a bigger one because you are going? Was it an option to use a bigger one? So basically, that's that's what we had available, and all the papers that I've done, um, basically um, these percutaneous veno veno bypasses, they've only used nine or ten uh, via bonds. They've not used anything bigger so far. For the subclavian? Yes, for the subclavian. Okay. Uh, John, what's your experience with yeah, that? It's, it's it's a little bit smaller. Uh, yeah, all that sense and all that. Stents that are available now, like the Cobera, which is a flared stent in which the end of it actually flares to about 12. Uh, and then there are other options like to be dedicated uh, stents, not necessarily covered if you, if you uh, want to use it, like the Vichy stent, for example, there are options that you can use uh, in that area. The other so, question I have. So the important, just, just to address the, the stent, the important thing is here, we have to use a covered stent, right? Because we're going through a subcutaneous trap. We cannot use an uncovered stent. And covered stents, I mean, in this, in, this, in this type of line, covered stents, you could only see them probably up to about 13 millimeters via bonds. Yes, uh, you I can't know. see anything bigger, yeah. Yeah, but there's a, there's a Covera, which they made bigger ones, which you can use. Okay. Or something like this. Did you try to cross the native vessel? Were you? Did you make an attempt to cross the native vessel? Oh yeah, absolutely. So basically, I've done a lot of these cases, and we're able to cross the native vessel in most patients. And this was a patient that we had spent about four hours on trying to cross the native vessel. We would usually try to use like sharp recanalization techniques. We're using the back of the, of the glide wire. We would even use like a Rochechide needle to crush sometimes a tips needle to cross. However, this patient basically had the left carotid artery basically sitting in that area. Again, remember, we're doing this procedure on a 2D x-ray uh, um, in Nigeria, and I, I am definitely not taking the chance of trying to cross the carotid artery, which is why we did not uh, try sharp recanalization techniques. Do you have crossing catheters, or do you just... Oh, yeah, we have crossing catheters, yes. Which one do you use? The 
So, so I would have to I would have to look at the name, but we have I know we have a CXI crossing catheter. We have several crossing catheters again. Remember that in our environment, we get our hands, especially this type of you know specialized equipment. We get our hands on whatever we could get our hands on. We don't have the luxury of you know having a shelf full of you know options like we are, we do in the U.S. And and most of recently, you put them on anticoagulation. For her, we did not put on anticoagulation. No. no. So most of my not. venous work, most of my venous work, I almost never put them put them on anticoagulation, and they do very well without anticoagulation. So you Arterial do stents, I do. Do I have antiplatelet like parvitas aspirin, or you don't do anything like? That? No, for venous, we don't do any anticoagulation. So we do a lot of, even here in Nigeria, we probably done over twenty venous recanalizations for SVC, stenosis, subclavians, or whatever. Once you basically stent them, because most of them are dialysis patients, anyways. We've done a few malignant, uh, malignant uh, SVC like uh, SVC syndromes. And we still don't put them on anticoagulation. And I've looked at the literature as far as anticoagulating in the setting of venous uh, stenosis or venous cases, and not a lot of people anticoagulate in these cases. What about antiplatelet? Do you put them on Parvix aspirin? No, no. Wow. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. It's really interesting that you, if you come to my environment, West Virginia, you probably will have a thrombosis in a week. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that's exciting to know in your experience. And I think that's, that's uh, again. So that's... even even in Pennsylvania, you know, I did a lot of iliocable reconstructions. Yeah. Right. For the iliocable yeah. reconstructions, I will put them on anti anticoagulation for about three to six months, and then I take them yeah. off, and yeah. we don't put them on anything after that. Well, that's that's interesting. In our in our community in West Virginia, I tell you, it'll be less than a week, they'll be thrombosed. Yeah, again, yeah. again, that's geographical yeah. issues. Yeah. Uh, geographical issues. And again, in Nigeria, that kind of tells us as we practice, we have to know the, uh, and that's why we have meetings such as this, so we can exchange yeah. ideas. Again, because I, when I worked with John in Clarksburg, West Virginia, and I moved two hours away, the disease process got worse in less than two hours in the same state. And for sense I used to use in, the, uh, in, the, in Clarksburg, um, the the uh, what was called it wasn't it wasn't the smart sense the one called smart symphony yes it was great stand to use in the SFA no problems at all as soon as I got two hours away it wouldn't work on an identical mm -hmm. patient so I abandoned stand in the SFA so 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 I, I really appreciate the fact that uh, you you do patients without need for attack coagulation that's exciting one of the things I also may have to say in my experience doing central venous work. I do know that I like the, the uh, fluency stent, uh, the covered stent, usually it goes to about 13.5, the largest size, and the uh, next size up is 12, 12 uh, millimeters by 40. They do really well, especially chronic occlusion. If you're able to cross it, you put a covered stent such as that, you're pretty much sure that they will stay open. Uh, you know, you're very uh, correct. Have, I've I've used the fluency a lot in basically endovascular, basically outflow stenosis for patients right. with uh, end-stage renal disease. However, in the cases where you're going through a subcutaneous tract, you obviously also need a very long stent. Uh, right. Most of the fluencies or flares are typically not that long, right? Uh, because correct. essentially in this patient, we use a 25 centimeter long stent because we overlap right. two stents in order right. to get enough uh, length to, um, to do the procedure. Nice job, nice work. Great job. Yeah, good job. One of the things that we also would say, Dr. Hamad, is the fact that we have to collaborate. Collaboration is key to success in, in the vascular in world, especially in our continent here, where we don't have the luxury of all the tools available in one institution. Our ability to, to collaborate will bring uh, items that we don't readily have that's present in another institution to bear in, in, the, in, in, in as a given instance, so patient care gets uh, improved overall. I thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to uh, be here today to give us this wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, I, I, am, I am super excited that people like you are uh, around now or coming around. I mean, as you could imagine, we're really on an island. I mean, uh, you can talk to people like Dr. Falashe, I mean, we've really been on an island here in, in Nigeria, uh, big, big expertise, equipment, everything. I mean, we really have to 
basically go overboard a lot to take care of patients. Like this patient, for example, those two stent grafts I used, she didn't pay for them, right? I have to basically yeah. get them subsidized from somewhere in America to get it done right. for her. So, yeah. I mean, we, we just have to face the realities of practicing around here. And again, collaboration is the key. That's the key. And again, along those lines, uh, in 2017, when I did a descending thoracic aneurysm repair in uh, National Hospital Abuja, same thing. You go to the hospital, 60 arms there, seven, one, one was working. And the one that was working, you couldn't see anything out of it because the technician was very worthless, pretty much, so to speak. And uh, you doing surgery, put one graft that was donated from Medtronic from the US, $20,000, one graft, no second chance, with dissection also. And I like you work on with cataracts in the eyes, but you know, we did it, but that is not an ideal situation. So I really do appreciate fantastic work that you all do in Nigeria with the limited resources you all have. So that's really exciting. Thank you so much, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker would be, uh, would you have that? Moving on, and we'll be able to catch them back on track with Dr. Shady and, and, and further down the line. Okay. All right, we'll get Dr. Palashi back on track, so hopefully we'll get better te technology here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. I'll make this quick. I don't know how much people. Um, well, you, have time. you have enough 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 time. All right. Let me share the slides. Okay. Um, can you see my slides? Can you see my slides? Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Okay, so I'm talking briefly about our work with open heart surgery as captured by a national registry. So I'm speaking on behalf of the various collaborators listed on this um, slide. We have 17 institutions that are contributing and these people um, cut across the 17 institutions. The registry is supported by both our surgical and cardiology associations. We started the registry in September 2020. The registry is internet based, can be accessed by any device that has access to the internet. That's the website, um, nigeriaheartregistry.com, which I would encourage you to please explore. Um, the registry is um, designed and maintained by me. I use a database engine called Caspio Bridge, based in the States. Um, we've been lucky with funding. It was initially self-funded for a few years, but as it grew larger, um, both Edwards Life Science and Cardiostatics International have stepped in to help us with the grants, and it has been renewed once so far. We hope to get more funding to continue this registry. So the purpose of the registry is voluntary contribution of data on heart surgery in Nigeria, so we can build up a registry of our activity. Our vision is to make our practice um, evidence-based, driven by um, a registry of the activity. So these are the contributing institutions. There are 17 of them, six in the public sector as listed, and 11 in the private sector, and it, it is growing every day. We decided to use a minimum data set of registry fields. Um, most cardiac databases are very large and can be a bit unwieldy. Since we have um, busy surgeons entering the data, we just picked a few key fields just so we could capture preventive data. So the 
minimum data type is as listed. So this is just snapshot showing what it looks like and accessing on your phone and accessing on your computer. So I'm going to take you through the registry and I'd encourage you to please um, take your time, go to the website and see much more. So we have the cost of surgery. We use our cost in last tooth as the benchmark because we are public sector. There is no real markup. So we divide our cost into the anesthesia cost, blood products, hospital fees, ICU fees, theater fees, the provision pack. And you can see that we list every item, which supplier and their contact, the cost per unit of the item, how many of the items we need, and the dates at which the cost was last updated. Or we, we make sure the cost is at least a month um, updated. So this is our registry data. Between January 2004 and October 2022, we have 802 cases on the registry. You can see here that the registry started out slowly, not much activity in the country, and it has gradually grown. And in the last few years, it is growing um, incrementally as we are adding on more um, institutions. So the activity is really growing. This is the same data presented in um, tabular form where you can see the institutions, the year, and the specific um, annual activity, totaling 882. So the case load, the distribution across the institutions, you can see here, this is total activity. So the tri-state group has the largest activity, they're private, 40%, followed by IFE and LASUS, both 13% um, each, and then first cardiology in ECOE, 12%, and um, the other 13 um, inst institutions. We also track activity, um, current activity. So this pie chart shows the current activity so far this year. And this year so far has been 173 cases and divided up between Tri-State in Lekki, Tri-State in Babcock, Ife, First Cardiology, Lassus, then Irene Okosu Memorial, Evercare, FMC Abuja, Regent Stroke, Booth Cardiac Center, Dr. John Willow Center. So this is just to show you that there's activity going on on a regular basis. I love this slide. This slide shows you the monthly activity in the last five years. This shows that on average, there are 15 cases being done somewhere in the country every month. So we don't have a situation where we have activity in January and nothing happens till June. That means that any patient who presents can get his surgery in one of these um, institutions and the activity is growing over time. This also means that as the activity grows, will we get enough monthly activity we can then begin to focus on more exposure and eventually training our residents at home. At the moment, with the small numbers, we can only expose them, not really train them. They need to go outside to high volume centers. But as the volumes begin to increase, that will become a reality. This shows the, the distribution of adults and pediatric cases, adults in blue, pediatric in green. Tricet in Babcock does about equal adults and pediatric. IFE does largely pediatric. Last week, where I practice, we, we focus on adults, and first cardiology is also adults. You can see the other centers do a mixture of adults and pediatric. So overall, the trend has been that um, the activity started out as adults in blue, but has increased gradually, and now it's about equal adults and pediatric. So overall, we have adults 55% and pediatrics 45% activity in the country. So looking at the adult cases, the most common cases are cabbage, closely followed by what about replacements, mechanical valves, then ASD repairs and um, valve replacements, and matter valve replacement with tricuspid repair. Interestingly, about 20% of our adult cases are tetralogy of follow correction. We get a lot of adult congenitals, largely from delays, in presentation, delays in diagnosis. So many patients actually present in, in adulthood with congenital issues. So this shows overall the type of cases being done in the adults. Single valves, 32%, cabbages alone, 20%, congenital, as I just said, 
double vowels and um, Gaza cases, like what Dr. Nino just spoke about, about 7% and other cases. So quite a wide spectrum of cases being done in the country. For the single vowels, we largely replaced them. Remember that most of these are rheumatic um, vowels, so there's not much scope to repair them and they present so late. So most of the vowels are mechanical valve replacements and about 10% are either rings or biological valves. Looking at the pediatric cases, the most common pediatric cases are tetrachic valve repair, BSD repair, ABSD repair, and ASD repair. And this just shows you the um, spectrum of pediatric cases. So with TOF, just under 30%, BSD repair, about 25%, ABSD repair, 8%, and a whole range of other cases. Interestingly, you can see that you have trunkless arteriosis corrections, you have um, arterial switches. So there's a very wide range of cases being done for both the adults and pediatrics. So overall, looking at both um, adults and pediatric, over half our cases are congenital, about 55%. And then you have um, single vowels, 18%. You have cabbages, 11%. Um, other cases, about 4%. Yeah, so that's the spread. Looking at outcomes, we were trying to track outcomes, but this is still very early because, as you well know, when the numbers are low, if you lose one or two patients, the mortality is um, overly highly represented. In addition, we are using risk stratification. Not all centers are filling in their data with the risk stratified data, but as it becomes more robust, we hope that we can compare our outcomes to the risk score for the patients. That being said, um, looking at single vowels, right now, mortality is about 6.7%, for cabbages about 9%, but this is still growing. So who is doing the cases? This is the most exciting slide to me. In green are the local teams, in blue are the visiting teams. And you can see that the cases have been increasing. Initially, in blue, we done by visiting teams, um, Kadak missions, but now the local teams have taken over. And overall, you can see that 72% of cases in the country are done by local teams and 20% by visiting teams. We also have a small thing, small app called the Activity Locator. So if a cardiologist or a patient wants to know where in the country can I get a procedure done, this shows an example using technology of follow. You type in technology of follow into the operation field and you search. And this shows you that IFE has done 30 cases, Tri-State 70 cases, shows you the annual um, numbers of other cases. And you can then decide where to direct the referral to. So in summary, we now have an online open heart surgery registry with easy data inputs with a minimum data set. We currently have 17 institutions that are contributing data. The data we have so far shows a rapid growth of open heart surgery in the last five years, and there's a wide range of activity in both adults and pediatric surgery um, across the country being done by teams based here in the country, which is really exciting. So I would say that traveling out for open heart surgery, this should only be by choice if the patient chooses to do so, not a necessity as it was many years ago, because open heart surgery is now widely available and it's much more affordable to do it here than traveling else. <clears throat> there are challenges. We're trying to get more of our colleagues to contribute data, because not all institutions are, are contributing, contributing data at the moment. If we have more contributions, the registry will be much more representative of our national practice. Costs, I already mentioned, it costs about $4,800 per annum. It's currently funded by Edwards Life Science and Cardiostats. We're seeking more funding so we can pay for a few years in advance to enable the registry to continue. So we're on the journey. The journey continues. Thank you very much. Thank you, buddy. Any questions from the audience? But what's the actual, uh, the, um, for us not here all the time, what's the, average cost for open heart surgery. If I have to convince somebody in the US to come here to have surgery under you, what would I tell them? 
uh, yes, you need to come to Nigeria to get a certain because the cost could be less. So in numbers, uh, dollars and cents, what would you tell me? I should tell them. Yeah, um, in the public sector, depending on the surgery on average, between three and 3.5 million. In the private sector, depending on the complexity of the surgery, between 5.5 and 7 million. Okay, what's that now? <laughs> That keeps changing. So about ten thousand. That's that's really good. I had that's the excellent. Maybe I'll get you a referral next week. <laughs> I had a fellow who traveled all the way from Bielsa. You know, uh, they were having all the uh, monies, and uh, he had like six vessels done. He had a host of issues, and uh, by the time he went through the hospital system in the U.S., uh, he had spent like close to one hundred twenty thousand. So yeah, so we really, uh, along with what the CEO of Duchess was saying earlier, should try to reverse medical tourism. And not only that, encourage people on the other side of the pond to look at skilled physicians such as you, surgeons such as you, who do great work here to uh, have their surgeries done here. First, it's cheaper. Two, they can have great Nigerian food while they're here. And third, in the Z family, and uh, if they're not Nigerians, they can still see see how things are done. So yeah, that's quite exciting. Any one question from, from Dr. Goji from Wari? Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Goji. I practice family medicine. Uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Wari, for this uh, presentation. I'm really very impressed by the initiative of your registry, of what you're doing, your association. And I really must commend you for that. Uh, uh, in you. your presentation, or in your summary, as you are concluding, you did say that there are a few other people that are not uh, feeding the registry. I'm just wondering, you know, um, who are they? Are they more in the public or in private? What? See that you're doing, and you have an idea of what the resistance might be that they are not feeding data, they're not um, adding to the registry. And I want to say this as a family physician who have been in, in the community of practice. Um, just like you said, that the, the numbers are coming yeah, because it's only when you see the cases they are referred from practitioners elsewhere outside cardio um, thoracic surgery and care. I want to say, and you made reference to it, uh, Dr. Oyi, there are a, 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 a number of patients that will benefit from open heart surgery. Either they are missed by us in private practice, they are missed by hospitals. So for that reason, uh, some patients who could benefit from what they are doing uh, never get to you. And that is why I want, I want, to, I want to commend the Duchess for I mean, very brief to set on this. First, I mean, I only watch your television when it was commissioned uh, to make such services accessible. I, I, may, I, may I ask? Um, if I'm going to refer a patient to you at the last one, um, what does it take? Is the reason for asking that? Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Let me start with the last one. Um, what, on, on our website, we have listed all the computing institutions and the adults and pediatric surgeons and cardiologists who are contributing data. So by going to our website, you have the contacts in all the various contributing um, institutions. You can use the activity locator to decide who's doing more cases, where I want to refer cases to, and then um, you can then give, give the person a call or send an email. <clears throat> so we have their numbers and um, email contacts. In terms of um, why some are not contributing data, that's a bit of a difficult one. With every initiative, you have those who are very keen, those who are not so keen. I believe that as we continue, as, as we continue with our activity, we'll encourage our colleagues more and more. Um, the first resistance was people were very wary 
about who owned the data. The first we will get the data and begin to publish and, um, ex and ex exclude them. Interestingly, we've been doing this now for a few years. We haven't yet published, largely because we want to make sure that we have everybody on board so that there is no feeling, <clears throat> there's no feeling of um, people being excluded and that the data is being used by somebody else for publication. So I think those are the concerns. Madam, one quick question. Um, quick question for you. Is there collaboration between the centers performing this sort of uh, and number two, are some centers emerging as better at doing certain types of procedures, which will naturally make such type of procedure gravitate towards them? Uh, those are my two questions. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> um, through our association, we collaborate both formally and informally. So we all know each other. We know who is doing what. We often visit each other and we share um, knowledge and often assist each other on cases. So say if I had a, a, a dissection, for example, I know that Lasso doesn't have facilities right now <clears throat> for the dissection, but Dr. Sanusi does plenty of dissections, which he's going to talk about later on today. So I would refer them to him. I would also go across and take part in the surgeries. So eventually, we might have those skills. So yes, there's plenty of um, ongoing uh, collaboration. Thank you. Yeah, we have an online question from Dr. Fel uh, Felix uh, Elijah in New York. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Falashe. This was, this is a very wonderful one. Um, I actually left as a senior resident in Kadotorazic before coming over to the United States. And this is a great initiative. We do not have um, a registry <laughs> at that time. So, but while, while I was there, there was this um, team that do come around to do open heart surgery, especially for pediatrics hospital for humanity. And it was a national hospital. And a couple of cases, you know, were done. I just, I feel like if we could reach out to probably national hospital, some of these things are in the registry over there. And that could also add to um, what we have. And they also visit some other hospital like Garbati Hospital in Abuja. So I guess more of that region is where they do go and some other northern hospital. So I feel we can add some of this um, institution to this uh, um, registry and adding their in, um, input to it will really make it um, more robust. That's just a contribution. Thank you, sir, for the great work you're doing, sir. Okay. All right. Okay. All our colleagues working across Nigeria are very much aware of our registry. <clears throat> we keep it voluntary, so we don't inadvertently step on any toes. Quite often, <clears throat> there are some bridges that are crossed the institution to be willing to convert the data, um, the individuals, the management. So we leave that to them, and we try not to get too involved. But all those who are interested are more than welcome. <clears throat> to data. Okay. okay. Very well, thank you, but I appreciate your help and time, and uh, hopefully we'll continue to collaborate and uh, for many years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, our next speaker, if we're about ready, uh, will be Dr. Veronica Guike, and uh, she comes to us. Uh, from the care of Lagos, Nigeria. She is an aesthetic physician and a medical entrepreneur. She's a, a, an aesthetic uh, uh, physician uh, who uh, has worked in many hospitals, including here in Dubai. And she has a lot of international uh, training, including uh, with the Diploma of Occupational Health for the countries from the University of Bergen, Norway. And, uh, Significant economics from healthcare delivery from the University of Pennsylvania, USA. She's a managing director of Sivola, uh, this program limited, and indigenous company set as a channel partner for Yoki by medical electronics. And uh, today she will be talking to us on improving of 
ultrasound imaging in Africa where soldiers can. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for having me here. My name is Dr. Veronica OBK. My name is Dr. Veronica OBK, and I'm, and I'm the CEO of Seven Map Based Hope. And what we do is use the technology to drive change in the Nigerian healthcare system. At the conference today, we'll be talking about our handheld wireless ultrasound device. Is the, so can I get my slides on? Is the, truly, truly wireless device. I know that there's a few in the market at the moment, but this one really stands out. So, okay. So, okay. Okay. so improving ultrasound imaging in Africa with Solos, Soloscan. Soloscan is, Soloscan is this, is this as a super small handheld ultrasound scan device. And when we were called to embark on this project as a channel partner of UK, the first thing on, on our mind was Africa. In terms of accessibility, in terms of mobility, in terms of integration of healthcare together. So we we'll say the future of wireless, the future is here, a truly versatile wireless ultrasound scan. And it's all about Giving Nigeria, it's all about giving Africa wireless connectivity. Sorry, I can't I can't read my slides from there. Okay. All right, so we introduced the most advanced wireless ultrasound device to the Nigerian and African market. We are delighted to say that our hand help device is a solution to the imaging problems in healthcare system, including maternal and infant mortality, um, also stroke, and um, other medical emergencies. The goal of the UK wireless ultrasound scan is to prove, improve patient outcome through reduction in morbidity and mortality. So we also talked about risk and uh, misdiagnosis. A lot of times, you know, things that we can think of using handheld point of care ultrasound scan, but because they're currently not available within our system, we need it or we say, okay, let's just do it. We have an active abdomen and we say, oh, let's just go ahead and ask about it because we can do a quick scan at that time. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to reduce cost of healthcare. We're always talking about affordability, affordability. If we spend the big price, the 50,000 US dollars to buy an ultrasound scan, you're really not going to make the money out of it and then you have to put the bill on the patient. So in terms of affordability, we want a small mobile scan that's affordable that makes sure that the cost of the patient is at the minimum. And at the end of the day, more people have access, especially in the rural areas. So we also, yes, so that goes to the next one. We want to improve health equity within the system. So equity, we want the people in the rural areas to have ultrasound scan. We don't want the woman in the village to travel out just to get to check her baby. We don't want the midwives at the, at the primary health care, care center to keep guessing. So we want to improve the health equity within our system. We also want to call out the break with telemedicine. So you're doing your scan, you can easily send the images to the radiologist. The radiologist doesn't have to be tied to the rural area. What the doctor wants to say is, is where that. So the, the, the radiologist can just you know, devote some time to access those files for people in the rural areas and read them and keep and help, you know, extend the services to them. We also want to improve patient satisfaction. The patients of today are changing. They want more, they're asking more from the doctors. Why are you getting, why can't you do an investigation? I want an extensive practice. And I think that the biggest thing that helps me is my advancing on the horizon. So even when people come up with acne, and I know that it's acne, I know what to do with them, I just put their face in the analyzer. And we see the same thing that all the children have But they feel more confident, we build more relationship, because they're seeing what I'm seeing, and I'm telling them, this is what we're going to do for you, and they're happy with that. So we want to build relationships with patients and doctors, 
By the time the patients know that the doctors know what they're doing, the doctors are on hand to help them. We also want to reduce brain drain. Eight of cardiologists left Nigeria and went to Canada or wherever he goes to. It will take him some time to start practicing it. Within that period, we've lost him in Nigeria and they've not yet been in Canada. <clears throat> but if we made that a family physician, I'm doing my echo, I really don't know how to interview. But the cardiologist is there, doing the images, move your probe here, move your probe here. We can still utilize his knowledge. We can still keep that knowledge in our system. Same as the radiologist. So that's what UK ultrasound scan is. The wireless ultrasound scan for collaboration. We also want to improve hospital efficiency and reputation. So it's all in terms of superior patient care. It's all in terms of collaboration. It's all in terms of research. It's all in terms of doing ultrasound scan differently. In my practice, in general practice, I've used ultrasound scans, and I know that they're newer ones, but the new ones are quite expensive. In my practice, then we have this trolley scanners, and when you have, when you finish doing the film, imaging, it's just there on the device. There's no way to collaborate. There's no way to share imaging. And that's why when we we're called on the UK project, we said, yes, this is what African needs. We're ready for it, and this is what we want to do. So what's the, what's the advantage of the UK ultrasound scan? Yes, I, I said that there are, there are lots of big brands in the market, but what stands us out is, the first thing that stands us out is our detachable probes. So it's like this. You don't have to buy different machines. You just have one machine and different probes. So this is a linear probe. It comes with a convex. It has six different probes with very advanced settings. Another thing that stands out is the high quality imaging and the zoom. So we will not say that we are equivalent to the 50,000 current machines US comparable to the mid-end machines. So why are we so good? Even though the brand is not popular, even though it's this, it's all because of the fact that UK ultrasound, UK biomedical is focused on only handheld ultrasound scan. So all the technology that we have, the put into this handheld ultrasound scan. If the big brands had to put so much technology into their ultrasound scans, their big trolley machines would go out of fashion. And that's the trolley. So they would leave more the food within their the, um, big machines because they want to keep that marketable. But we have moved all the whole advanced setting it has a B with the P mode, the, all the modes, the BM, the power, power doppler, the pulse rate, all that is within the system. So um, what else stands us out? So it's light, great, and portable. We have six advanced modes. We have wireless connectivity. We can be used in remote areas, which is what we're thinking of. Dr. Oye is from Biosyn State. If you have to move in the water with your big trolley machine, I know that it's flooding at the moment. It's going to be a big problem. Not, not, not any bad way, but I'm just trying to tell you the situation we are in Nigeria. So having a portable, device like this would let anybody within the remote areas, irrespective of who the person needs and where the person is, to access ultrasound scan imaging. So all the same, the minimize brain drain through collaborations and real-time analysis, training and research purposes. So you can view it on all devices. I can view it on my phone, you can view it on my tablet. I can share my screen to the big device if I have a training. So do my assignment things, I'm sharing it here, I do my training. So the good thing about it is the battery life. The battery life is eight hours, up to eight hours. We charged it now in Lagos. We took a flight to a remote area in Nigeria. You can use that charging, that charge in the battery capacity to run your clinic, maybe a five hour clinic, a six hour thing. You don't have to think of recharging it's kind of anymore. And also sterilization. So the whole idea of having a handheld ultrasound scan is also for the use of the theater. So you want to move from open biopsies to peptidal biopsies, you use the ultrasound scan to make the biopsies. And it's easy to sterilize. I remember when I was in general practice, I would have to move the trolley into the label ward. Sometimes you're moving the trolley out and there's blood on the ruler. You would, step, you would clean up your probes and all, but really, really, I don't remember going down to the trolley to clean the trolley. 
And that's how we move uh, uh, four miles around the city to give us a not a coma. So it's easy to sterilize and you can use it for multiple purposes. So what areas can we use the solar ultrasound scan device in medicine? It can be used in vascular treatments, the surgical and non-surgical interventions, the emergency room, anesthesia, basically all areas of medicine. Even in dermatology, these days if you have to do a filler, you want to align the vessels so you don't put fillers into the vessels and other things. Sometimes I was speaking with my uh, consultant dermatologist and I asked him something, I said, maybe one day ultrasound scan might, you know, take the place of biopsies in terms of uh, benign lesions, when you do a scan and they're not, they're not looking any suspicious. You don't have to do a biopsy. You can just go ahead and do something that is more cosmetically present for the person rather than going straight and doing the biopsy. So at several months, we are, okay, thank you. We have brought Yuki, we have brought a solar scan to Nigeria. And what do we offer the Nigerian public, the African public? We offer them a revolutionary handheld ultrasound device with two standard truth probes and four additional probes. So whatever area of medicine, transvaginal, whatever area you would find a probe within the solo scan. We offer product training, we offer doctors, doctor, online doctor guidance on how to use the equipment. We offer after sales service, we offer two year product warranty, and we offer a credit plan through our banking partners. We offer device maintainers, and we offer temporary equipment for use during repair. Um, the temporary equipment for use during repair is within region. So it's not going to be available everywhere, but I know that we'll, we'll make it available to in strategic places where we have a good cluster of doctors. And we have um, ultrasonographic training with our partners too. So in summary, I'd say that the world is rapidly evolving and offering borderless special care. And offering borderless special care has become an integral part of efficient healthcare service delivery. There's a huge cost, cost reduction benefit from integrating point of care ultrasonography into patient care. And it would be our honor to like to lead this healthcare revolution in Nigeria with you as our clients. We want to help you provide the best care to your patients, increase your hospital efficiency. Welcome to the world of high quality imaging with solar scan ultrasound imaging. Thank you. So the next thing is just videos before I go. So I just want to play the you just see how it works. Um, just can you play it? Thank you. Okay, can move to the next one. So these are how the images would look. <coughs> Next one. So these are the images. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Any questions for <laughs> okay. um, I currently my practice use the water plant. Okay. Uh, this seems to be a much better option because of the wireless uh, what's the cost? Um, Please, I'm dressing. Okay, so everyone is dressing, of course. The cost is $7,500 at the moment. 
Yes, but we're able to. So we would have a group of doctors that wanted to fight together. So let's say there's the group of personal surgeons, we're open to give them discounts. And at the moment, like I said, that we have a payment plan over 12 months. So it's um, no collateral, no working on our plan, so it's no collateral. You just come in, tell them what you get from us, and we need to give you that payment plan. Very expensive. You can buy almost three butterflies. Yes, but um, butterfly would run for only one hour. Butterfly would uh, doesn't have detachable clothes. So if you had, uh, if you wanted more from butterfly, you buy butterfly. <laughs> Does that price include all the clothes? So it includes two clothes, the standard clothes. So it includes, so if I'm the young yeah, ambassador, so anyone you want. So you have the small, uh, small linear, you have the big linear, you have the convex, you have the the convex caveat and have the convex and have the transvaginal. So it all depends on what works is your practice. And it's so that what's the do with your practice, you know, you can get that with that price. But then, of course, if you want to come out to the lower rate, you might say, oh, I'm going to do that, that's what I saw. And we need to do that with you too. You have broad covers, like sterile sleeves, like you want to use it. Yes. yes. And, and that comes with it, or do you have well, the items? Well, either way, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just bring it Okay. Now, is that since it's wireless and it runs on the software, do you have options for real time remote scanning? Meaning the technician is scanning, but I can be in another city watching you scan real time on, on, on like the apps that they communicate. Okay. At the moment, the apps don't communicate, but two ways to do that is that you can actually put your Zoom on. And the, uh, the technician is doing it and you're interpreting for him. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is that when you're doing images, you can record, video record. Yeah. But what I'm saying is some of the ultrasound platforms now have the way in which you log into your app, I log into my app, the app stop, and as you're scanning real time and watching, and I can actually tell you, angle your probe this way, do this, do that to see things. So and, and real, see real time, it's like you're in the room. Doesn't have that yet. No, but with the Zoom, you can you can read that gap with the Zoom. Okay, yes, with the Zoom, you can read that, just like we're saying that with the real time. So you can actually, yeah. seems very clear, you can actually tell your team, so you can just um, share your, you just share your screen on the, uh, the uh, same screen with Zoom, and you can do that. Last question, sorry. What's the difference between the Q7 and the Okay, so the Q7 is comes with the extra transvaginal probe and the small small complex small linear. For the DAs? No, no transvaginal, no small linear. It has the small complex. It's cheaper than that. Yes, though it's just cheaper. So that is six out of five. I agree. Yeah, have more questions for you? Please. As I have a question. Yeah, doctor has a question. Okay. Does it matter the Android system? No, it doesn't matter if it's an Android system or an iPad or a Windows system. It's just that the person still has to be strong. So we need new ones, new processors that we can work with. I have the, uh, yes. the iPad system. And it does work well, but I'm really, I'm really impressed that the image is actually superior. Very well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. That's good. All right. Moving right along, we'll try to uh, move things along and catch up with lost time. And uh, our next speaker comes to us today in person uh, to speak to us about Incredible care for the master surgery. He is Dr. Shay uh, Oshman, and uh, he is uh, an ardent uh, collaborator and uh, I'd say uh, communicator for the uh, master surgery. Uh, Dr. Shay, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Dr. Shay Oshman, I'm a master surgeon and I'm also a collaborator with the Physician Society of Nigeria. I'm also a collaborator with the Physician Society of Nigeria. I'm also a collaborator with the Physician Society of Nigeria. I'm also a collaborator with the Physician Society of Nigeria. So I'm excited to. Uh, uh, bringing today to talk to us is well trained uh, both in the United States and the UK, and has made a move to come to Nigeria to provide excellent care under the A3C platform. Right? Yes, yes. And uh, so, uh, Dr. Rachel will be talking to us again on anesthesia, critical care, or in the master surgery. Thank you. 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 Th
Thank you. Thank you very much. And good morning. Is it still morning, everybody? Yes. yes. Thank you for the opportunity, Dr. Lee, to address this August gathering of most insurgents, as I thought, and uh, interventionists as it well. Um, I think there is only one other anesthesiologist in the room. Was that the previous speaker? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are generally not the ones that people come to hospital to see. Yeah, people walk into a hospital, nobody asks for a critical care physician. Nobody says, oh, where is the anesthetist? I've come with some condition or the other. We're usually the secondary or tertiary people that are seen, if at all. Most of the time, the patient doesn't even remember you when they are gone. But the surgeon always does. Yes, sir. the surgeon always does, especially when it goes wrong. They will be there hovering behind you and hoping that you know what to do. So one of the reasons we came uh, as a group back to Nigeria to start anesthesia and critical care consultants was because we realized that there was a lot of surgery, different types. Things have improved. But when I first left the NHS in 2015, uh, there was a death of anesthesiologists, critical care people. I mean, that, that condition, that situation has improved quite considerably, but we're still struggling to build up the numbers. For example, there is no critical care training fellowship program, neither the postgraduate medical colleges or neither the West Africa or the national. So if you find somebody who says that they are intensivists or they are trained in intensive care, they are invariably trained abroad. But be that as it may, <clears throat> In order to discuss endovascular anesthesia and critical care, I have chosen to use two models. The first one is the acute ischemic stroke, which I'm not sure. Does anybody here who does the EBT and the endovascular thrombectomy? No? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, this particular feature attached to it from the anesthetic point of view, not just the standard routine. And there are a couple of papers that came across while I was preparing for it, which I thought would be useful. And then as the general model for anesthesia, I was going to use the eval. Um, <clears throat> as an overview, what I think we'll be able to cover in this space of time that we have will be the usual things that us in this case worry about, pre-operative evaluation, what are the relevant things for the focus? And interestingly, you know, the vascular surgeons, cardiac surgeons usually have done most of this. By the time they call us, you will discover that they check most things out. The difference here is that in this environment, there are things that are actually or can be beyond our control as doctors in order to get things done. And sometimes it falls on the anesthetist people to take care of. That's why I've got the last bullet there, the local factors. So let's quickly dismiss the anesthesia for the treatment of uh, endovascular treatment of ischemic stroke. I, I only have three or four slides on that. Now, essentially what happens is that they go inside the, the arterial wires, sometimes they suck out the clot, sometimes they break it up and then suck it out. But the important thing is that if the patient isn't adequately prepared, if you haven't got the patient in optimal state or during the anesthesia, the patient becomes cardiovascularly unstable, then it becomes a question. Now this slide illustrates a comparison between general anesthesia and conscious sedation. A lot of these cases can actually be done with some local anesthesia, popping the wire through a local anesthetized space, and then follow it to where you want radiologic get your clot done. But if you look on the left side, general anesthesia seems to be the poor junior brother in terms of the technique. Most of the time, you will find that if you can get away with doing the patient under conscious sedation for the following pros, the hemodynamic stability and the neurological monitoring that is possible because the patient is generally conscious but sedated. Um, the big disadvantage, of course, is the patient will move, the airway can be difficult to manage. And if on the balance of risk, uh, you feel that this is just not worth it, then you really should just go ahead and do it. Now, the paper that I'm referring to uh, have been done a while ago. 
most of them came in from the Scandinavian countries, where it is quite obvious, or it became quite obvious, that hypertension was a problem. Uh, the actual number that for safe outcomes or better outcomes is actually 140 millimeters of mercury. What is what is your experience here with that kind of those of you who do this? I haven't done many of them. The hypertension, the three things that you critically when you're doing from back to me, carotid center, and three critical things with blood pressure, like yes. you said. Uh, the second thing is keeping the patient still because you are working with a little millimeter margins or any small with end of the multiple images you prolong the procedure time and extra radiation exposure because you can inadvertently deploy and then you have to use extra devices. So that's the second thing. The third thing is here with typically I have gone to Mean most of these on that general, if they can tolerate, if there are no uh, significant cardiac risks to that because of all these factors. So, so you would be a proponent of general. If, 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 if unless there are some big contraindications for those factors, that because you have better control of the airway, you can completely keep the patient immobile so you can limit your procedure time. Accuracy of the appointment of the stents and stop that. So, my direction, despite the fact that I haven't done many of these, it right. is actually not. So, I'm glad that it has been of, of value. Because sometimes when you prepare a talk and you are talking about something that you haven't got much experience in yourself, you are wondering whether this is still up to date, this is still the current thing. And it turns out that it is. Thank you very much for that. Now, let's now go general. Let's just look at vascular patients. Vascular patients, whether you're looking at the blood vessels in the heart, the brain, or anywhere, they have vascular paths. One of the reasons they have presented is that they have the risk factors associated with becoming vascular paths. And some of these things, when, they, when we consider what their comorbidity profile is like, some of these things are important enough for us to consider, not necessarily on place by place basis, because I say most of the time, the surgeon or the operator interventionist has already done investigations. But I think it's worthwhile mentioning that, for instance, the renal function, because of the amount of contrast that is sometimes used, it is important that the renal function is not borderline. Because you can actually now tip somebody who has a vascular problem over into being AKI chronic. Naturally, you would do chemistry, hematology and all the other things. Antibiotic and anti, sorry, anticoagulant therapy is often concomitant. affected strongly by it. But it's something that I'm hoping we'll be able to do. We'll be able to develop. Uh, the, the doctors, surgeons, everybody involved would have done all the echoes. They will be telling us <laughs> what that part of the patient is like. So it's actually quite, it's quite a relief to go in and do any vascular stuff. Now, during the operation, what are the things that we tend to want to focus on? We have to make a choice, but as you rightly pointed out, in most cases, we go for a general anesthetic. But there are situations where you would have a choice. And I mean, that is probably not the subject of this kind of talk. It's probably a much wider discussion. But let's look at things like location. I don't think we have hybrid theaters yet. Does anybody have a hybrid operating room in their hospital? 
the one we use at first cardiology can be described. In other words, the cath lab can become an operating room in the event of converting to open. Um, that is another level to which an um, opening that we aspire. And all, all kinds of vascular cardiac procedures these days may need to convert to, to, to an open from the vascular approach. Uh, is anybody in the room who's had cause to convert from endovascular to, to open? So currently, nobody really worries about it anymore. Remember the last hospital I worked in the UK? I was because, like, oh, me, I'm going to do that here. Yeah? Are you sure if you need to come back? Till I left, three years later, I only had it in one case. So, yes, like we've done, for um, example, the case of the world, uh, says a certain path lab or the certain car procedure, I'll be not uh, not open yet. Was open. Well, open, but not <laughs> the kind, not like the economy of yeah, the kind we are talking uh, about. Uh, and the complexity of the procedure is important as, a, as an indication of what you can expect post-op. If it is a simple, straightforward trouser, straight graft, but as soon as it starts to go just now, as soon as the graft itself is particularly long, uh, you begin to think, mm, what are we going to be taking care of post-op? And uh, I've left the best for last, the worst of the complications that, have, that come from things like that. Um, the monitoring is pretty standard. If you can't do invasive monitoring, some of them don't even need it. If you can't do invasive monitoring, it's probably not the area that one should do because it's, we take it for granted now. But when we first started, invasive monitoring was a big deal. <laughs> you, you, you remember? Back to it, and I'll come back to it at least once, one more time. In this environment, bleeding, massive blood transfusion, uh, blood and blood failure is a big deal. Not as much as it used to be, but please don't take it for granted. It's not just for vascular. It doesn't. It kind of makes sense if you're doing vascular stuff. Repeat. Now, what do we do if we start looking for? ischemia blocked grafts and the usual complications that one expects with these things is, is really just vigilance. But because you and I are not going to be there all the time, it's important that we emphasize those aspects to the nurses who are going to be there all the time so they get the kind of training. Unfortunately, that training is not native to us here. It's just one of those things. So if you're working in this environment, you actually have to make a special effort to say, look, this is what we are looking for. And every now and then, See one more. What, what's your experience, though, with the monitoring post of oh, yes. some of those things? So, one, I think I've actually uh, of the, the, um, the need of sending your patient to a better monitoring area, like a step down, like just to care. HDU uh, is, 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 yeah, is the monitoring because mm -hmm. I'm surprised that if the world nurses uh, have no clue Absolutely. at all. And um, the thing they need, like, in fact, the environment that is still monitor policies and things like yeah. that, communicate to you can be very hard. They, they really don't know what to, what to look out for. I mean, that phrase, that phrase comes to mind. You know, the operation was successful. It is our problem, but it is not ours to solve. But if you are not vigilant, people who are looking after the patient don't pick it up early enough because they don't know, they haven't seen it before. Nobody is taking the time to say, look, if this or that or the other happens, this is what you write, this is the number you call, then you might have a problem. Yes, that's it. The best for last. I remember when I was doing my training, that was the big word. You guys, 
you guys in vascular, you know the Atanko is. We, we read it and we were very excited about it. But the important thing is, is that it's, it's where the stent is. It's when the stent crosses the place where it becomes a problem. We've mentioned them already. I mean, that blood, that bridging that whole scenario around blood and blood products, I, I don't think I can emphasize it more. The number of patients I've watched, not necessarily exsanguinate in one go, but over a period of time, and we have stopped getting the blood products that we need. We take it for granted when we live and work abroad that you are going to get FSB, you're going to get uh, cryoprecipitates, and even factors. Then you, what is it? The patient must die from you know, excessive bleeding, but it still happens here. So please, if you have to do anything and you even suspect, I, I think I have to do a radical prostate tomorrow. And I don't know why we are still doing radical prostate activity. But already I'm getting that slight tachycardia. By tomorrow, it will be 120. It's just about 95 now, the heart rate. But by tomorrow, my heart rate will be over 100. Hey. That's how, that's how, no, if you think it's not true, ask anybody who works here. That's exactly how it works. They just don't, it's, it's part of, it's not part of our culture. Yet. And every time I go somewhere and my voice gets a little bit like that, so that that troublemaker has come again, it works. When Dr. Ishala, oh, that Dr. Ishala, you just be, that time he calls you, that time he just starts getting so whatever it is, whatever technique you guys have that you can use to ensure that that is the response times are better, please use them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nishala. Appreciate your time. And uh, any questions for him, please? I have a question, Dr. Doctor. Doctor. Question. Oh, yes. My colleague. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say another comment yes. on the response time. Yes. Um, I think that it has to do with training because um, even in the medical school, we're not trained to be responsive. Not with that speed. Yes, not with that speed. Yes. Yes. Yes, and I think that in the label, I, I spent almost five years there, over five years there. We didn't have the warning, but we had two deaths, maternal mortality, post uh, surgery. One was bleeding, so she was powerful and she was bleeding. But because she was experienced, she just overlooked it like Nokia, and you know, you go in, just the same way you talked about blood and blood product, so you go in. And her whole bed is full of just this full of blood. I don't know yet. Why didn't you talk to her? I should for the normal. It's not the be normal. By the time we tried to get blood from her, we lost her. Then the second one was uh, what, what I'm saying in terms of responsiveness at the, at the hospital is the movement between the theater and labor ward is like 10 minutes. Immediately you do have the obstructed labor, we're just moving. Just, there's a different culture there, which of course is the culture that I learned coming out of medical school and going there for a while. I stayed there and I was able to learn that responsiveness. So I think that in terms of responsiveness, it has to do with training. It really has to do with training. You want you, you, you can learn to do sometimes I'm, I hear some of my colleagues talking to patients, and I'm surprised because most of my medical career has been in private practice. And the way that you talk to patients is different from the way that some 
the way that in quote they talk today in the government hospital. And when you're in the consultation room and someone in the government hospital is talking to a patient, you're wondering, this person is going to pay for this consultation or it's a big consultation. <laughs> you're having at the moment. So I think that it has to do. Uh, I want to align myself with that as you spoke about that, that concern. I I I could share with you. Um, but providing solution rates yes. in all the places I have practiced, yes. I finished my house job. Mm -hmm. I have been leading this. Yes. I'm advocate for it. And we are practice now. Everybody runs. Ah, I absolutely. Need because you need from the front. Yes. yes. As a house officer, I saw our seniors, a missionary, their wives, Americans, in Baptist, ah. the and I cook. Yes. They lost. They even pick babies. Yes. yes. No matter how the senior. Baby that needed to be taken care of. Take away from the woman. She will run. And we must have to change her. You know, to get blood, she runs. Everybody runs. And I was saying, the culture. Culture. Absolutely. Even in, in, let me share this. I sat in Kaduna, in the general hospital. Yeah. I made the nurses. I, I, I took charge of the children. Mm -hmm. I made the nurses grow <laughs> up. Absolutely. So, so in that is in force yeah. that can change that. I, I, I only have two comments. I need to, to address both, both your work comments and, and questions. I, I, one of the things I do is medical simulation training. And I don't know how many of you have been to a copper simulation center. We don't have one in the country yet. One of the things that we can address, because the, the four domains, if you like, that's how we used to call it then, knowledge, skill, attitude, behavior. It's easy, we are clever people, like yes, naturally, we are clever people. We can teach knowledge and skill. We are receptive, we want to know we are curious. But you see that attitude and behavior, it is not even just Nigerians, it's anywhere in the world. If you are teaching, one of the domains that is most difficult to teach and to train is that behavior, attitude, and behavior. So if you use medical simulation, which if you don't mind my describing it, a room where there are close circuit TV cameras, there are actors, usually there are clinicians, and then everything in the room is real, even the phone works. The, uh, if you put up an X-ray, you see TCG. Doesn't matter what it is, and the patient is the only thing that's not real. So you can design scenarios, uh, um, uh, design scenarios to elicit responses that will demonstrate attitudes, record them, attitudes and behavior, record them, and then go for a debriefing because the real training comes from the debriefing after the scenario has been run. You, you have to understand. Correct. Uh, okay. You could also track response times. Correct. And incentivize. That is the best way to fix it. And incentivize. People. You say if a patient appears to be dog, and you try to turn from the dog to XYZ, when you turn from the dog to see the dog or whatever, and you report it, and you incentivize it, say this is our benchmark, 10 minutes. And if everybody gets 10 minutes, then the language you all understand is <laughs> it's, yes. it's even every member of the team will be reporting each other. Right? <laughs> I don't, don't let us down. Well, that's the quickest one. Okay. I like it. I like it. I really do. I think I'll try and put that. Yeah, one of the questions I have for you, and it's John, and your experience in the US is that you do a complex either my femoral, my past surgery, and useless. Beautiful surgery is just done well. And you send the patient to the ICU. Yes, in the United States of America, but guess what? You still have problems. And sometimes the problems can be on <coughs> record. Where you expect a phone call when someone's going wrong, and you don't get that phone call. And next thing you see, the patient is loaded on multiple pressures. Literally, 
I'm Max on this, Max on that. I'm like, are you serious? Have you been being like, what about, what about, look at it, you just had to take a survey and it's Max on that. So it's along with training comes the fact that we have to integrate that the people thinking about patients must be trained after what we want. That early phone call can make a difference between official living and not. So that, it's, it's important. I mean, it, it's annoying to have a patient not do well because of your staff who is supposed to be frontline manager that patient on the night does not give you a bad call. But I'll call you on the temperature is at 100 or 99.9. Really? <laughs> no, that's what you know. But the patient has that by about 12, and you don't get home. With a page of 7.4. Exactly. So those are the things that we will need to change as we train the other uh, physicians, the nurses, and all that to uh, start thinking in that direction. Yeah, so we're doing very well on time. Uh, thank Dr. Schaefer uh, for your uh, insightful talk. Appreciate your help. Our next speaker comes to us uh, today from many parts of the world. He started his career here in Nigeria and moved on uh, to, uh, uh, to the United States uh, where he uh, worked, uh, did general surgery at Charles Drew uh, University Health Science Center in Los Angeles. Then proceeded again to do adult cardiac surgery at SUNY Downstate uh, and uh, did uh, pediatric cardiac surgery uh, fellowship at Emory University and uh, Dan had the uh, audacity to come back to Nigeria. Uh, he's doing quite well. Dr. Michael Sanusi is an associate professor of surgery at Babcock University and attending uh, at the Dry State uh, Hospital here in Lagos. We're honored to have him uh, talk to us today on the exciting topic, thoracic aneurysm treatment. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Oye, for inviting me to speak, and um, I've um, thoroughly enjoyed and learned from all the speakers so far today. And, uh, uh, nice to see my buddy and classmate, John, here. Yeah, I've called him many times uh, to get advice on vascular patients. Uh, every time I, I have a question on a major vascular case, I, I look to John, and he has not failed me yet. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, I'm, I'm just going to talk about uh, our management um, of um, thoracic aortic um, aneurysms. Um, there, obviously, there are many ways to skin a cut, um, but my experience here in Nigeria has made me develop um, the kind of technique that I think works for us here, helps, um, I think it's safe and easily um, replicable. And as I give this, um, talk to our association um, about a month or so ago of, of cardiothoracic surgeons in Nigeria. Um, so I'm just going to talk about um, our technique and our institutional experience, which does not translate to hundreds of cases. <laughs> but, so um, uh, um, talking about the aortic root and ascending aneurysms, um, our own indications for surgery, which it, um, goes more with the um, um, American and the European um, societies um, is uh, aorta of about uh, ascending aorta of about greater than five centimeters, um, and then patients with um, you know genetic defects like uh, muffins, Usually, when the aorta is greater than four point five centimeters, we have no um, way of um, diagnosing um, that syndrome there. But that will do a small, uh, smaller aorta before you intervene. And then, of course, when the aorta, when there's associated disease, like maybe valve disease, you have to replace an aortic valve, or the patient has coronary artery disease and they have an aorta greater than four and a half centimeters, you really uh, should do something about it. Or there's a, you're monitoring a patient and the growth rate is more than half a centimeter a year, or a patient that has acute or chronic dissections. So we, um, um, obviously, use um, the median stenotomy incisions. We are careful that most of these patients, most are uh, here, I don't think we've seen and we've treated an aortic aneurysm that's less than seven and a half or eight centimeters. By the time they come to us, it's because they're 
they are desperate and they are very symptomatic. It's not just a patient that was picked up um, on a CT scan. You know, they usually come when they have severe AI. That the ALTA is eight centimeters. We've had the, I think our largest ALTA has been about uh, nine centimeters that we the sending ALTA that we have to treat. And so usually the chest is very congested and we take time opening up and doing our media stenotomy. So and um, so one thing that works for us here is um, the axillary artery uh, handulation. So that way, when we handulate the axillary artery, we can have antibody flow to the brain uh, throughout the procedure. We don't have to go, we don't go on circulatory arrest. We don't have to go to decrease the temperature so much that um, we, have, we have a long time warm patient and we have coagulopathies you know, because we've gone down to the traditional 18 to 20 degrees centigrade. So we usually just cool out. Um, so because of the um, um, axillary artery, which we usually, even though we say axillary, usually we cannulate the axilla or the subclavian artery, you know, um, the incision in the deltal pectoral group to follow up, um, you know, something to show the phallic vein, follow it up to the axillary um, artery, divide the pectoralis major and then the pectoralis minor tendon. Once in a while, we can, um, we, we, we don't, we can move the um, pectoralis minor tendon um, to the side. And the actual is usually in that fat part, just underneath the pectoralis uh, minor tendon, um, push to the side and exposes the, um, the artery, which we and then, uh, usually would sew a, um, a graft to it, uh, eight millimeter graft to, um, so that way we can get a good size um, cannula um, into it. We generally, we use a 16 millimeter uh, cannula for antibody cannulation, and then we don't have to um, change it um, uh, in, um, in the middle of the case. It's usually enough to perfuse the patient throughout the surgery. And um, <clears throat> the one time where we um, didn't use the, the DACRON or PTFP grafts, uh, eight millimeter grafts, we actually had um, an, uh, a, a dissection uh, when, we went, when we went on. So 100% uh, um, of the time we use that graft, but there are definitely um, candles that can be used uh, without um, sewing a, uh, a graft on. I think the risk is a bit um, higher. And here in our environment, we're all about um, safety, you know, because we never get that second chance. Um, <clears throat> so the the right, we, um, Usually, I usually do a right atrial cannulation at the atrial um, at the appendage. So when we put that um, cannula in, uh, or we can pull it down southwards to the feet, and it's, so the whole aorta is exposed all the way to the roots of the aorta. And always put, uh, put in a right superior um, venous cannulation to prevent the. Um, left ventricle from getting um, distended. So, so because when as we're cooling down, um, you know, the ventricle tends to slow down and starts to distend. And um, to prevent um, endocardial injury, we always make sure that left ventricle is well vented even before arresting uh, the heart. And then we'll try and arrest the heart with a coronary sinus um, catheter, catheter and coronary sinus. This is. Um, uh, sometimes for me, it's a uh, hit or miss because the heart has been pushed down the huge aneurysm so inferiorly that it's sometimes difficult to candidate the coronary uh, sinus um, blindly. But if we if we don't, we arrest, um, arrest the heart by pulling and um, do, using austere handling to, um, to give cardioplegia to the um, right and left coronary arteries. So it, uh, there's, um, if the patient has a dissection, an aortic dissection, acute dissection, still uh, after really cooling down, clamp the um, aorta, but um, there's controversy about um, clamping the aorta in an acute dissection, but if you can get it done, um, which we do, it actually makes surgery um, faster. So, and then um, the aortic valve, again, the aortic valve is competent to give anti-grade um, anti uh, cardioplegia. If it's not competent, we give retrograde cardioplegia 
and or we open up the ALTA and we use direct um, coronary sinus, I'm sorry, direct uh, coronary artery, um, left coronary, right coronary artery, um, austere cannulation um, to give cardioplegia. Um, one thing, um, um, we always make the in our incision, um, um, a longitudinal incision because sometimes the coronary um, osteo have moved and if you make a transverse incision, you can um, inadvertently damage uh, coronary osteo. So, uh, so the, the um, key to this presentation is um, the technique that we use, uh, which we didn't use while I was in the United States in my center where I trained, but I um, kind of um, picked it up um, later. I think it's um, safer, is the, it's called the mini skirt technique, which um, has the advantage that you have two layers of uh, suture at the aortic root. And through, uh, which helps prevent um, bleeding. And also, um, you don't have to use um, as much glue um, to seal the <coughs> which we don't always have available here. It is available, but not, it's kind of like intermittent. So, um, what we do with the miniskirt technique is uh, what, um, and then it's cheaper also because you don't have to by the preformed conduit, which um, um, is generally used in the Western um, Hemisphere to replace um, aortic roots and aortic um, aneurysms. So the the um, the key is we, we just get a regular valve. Here yeah, we use um, mechanical valves um, in our environment because um, again most patients. Um, they cannot afford the surgery in the first place, but then they struggle to bring resources together to, um, um, so they can afford surgery, friends, relatives, job, you know, they can afford the surgery. So you don't want to use a valve that can degenerate. So the valve or seven valves, they don't need anticoagulation, but they can degenerate after six to seven years, and then the patient may need to have another um, surgery. The plus, uh, for those parasitic valves, that there's no anticoagulation needed, at least not beyond uh, <clears throat> six months. So, what well, we tend to use the um, mechanical valves that can uplift the patient but need um, anticoagulation. But there's, um, um, we, our patients still, this, um, despite of the um, um, concerns for. Um, and, uh, complications based on anticoagulation, bleeding, or, or thrombosis. We, our patients seem to do quite well in this environment, and papers have been written from the third world about um, the safety of um, comparable safety of valves that need anticoagulation. And patients do they, they live they live for a long time, and they don't have repeat um, surgery. But the key to what we do is, I tried to put in a slide, a little, yeah, okay. So the key to what we do uh, for our roots, uh, um, for our roots is that we, we uh, on the table, we place a mechanical, we measure out the, uh, the annulus of the aorta and um, we pick the valve that fits the annulus. That's not too big, we like it to sit inside the annulus and then we pick a graft that is about three sizes bigger than that graft, than that um, valve, and we, we tuck it in there um, in a way that there's a skirt about this one centimeter or so below the valve. And then we, so that when we, the, when we put our valve stitches in to the annulus, our valve stitches go through the annulus, through the valve, and then out to the graft. All the way around, and we tie that down. Then we have another, and then we, when we are removing the, the aneurysm, we leave also a centimeter of um, aneurysmal tissue, like it's going to be incorporated as a second layer with, um, with the graft, so that it really decreases um, um, bleeding and um, the need for blood products, uh, like uh, Dr. Rachel was talking about how difficult it can be when, uh, to get blood sometimes. But when we 
Well, since we started using this technique, we uh, need for uh, blood product as significantly uh, reduced. We are still, uh, I think we still transfuse more than we need to, um, just because we're a bit, um, I think we're a bit paranoid and um, our anesthesiologists do not uh, tolerate borderline matters. Uh, so, we don't, uh, so the, the, at the least, um, we still have to kind of um, convince them that we, you know, you can patient with slightly lower hematopoiesis, but it's for a good reason. There's not much, there's not um, much of a blanket in this environment, so you know, we don't want to push the envelope. So, but um, with this technique, we decrease a lot of bleeding that comes from the um, from the aortic. Um, Roots. This, this is uh, so. This is that um, technique. Uh, try to make a um, artist depiction. You can see how good an artist I am. So one to one. That's the valve inside the dacron graft. Um, into the goes to the annulus and two to two. Two is the extra skirt of dacron graft and the extra and a little extra anusimal tissue that we use. To the, uh, take advantage of it to secure hemostasis, so it uh, so blood cannot sip um, past. Um, it's difficult. So blood usually doesn't sip past those two layers if, you, if they are well if they are well done. And um, sorry, before here. So the next area of bleeding is the usually the left coronary um, anastomosis. Where they can, where that's another potential to bleed and require blood products. So what we do is we try and make the anastomosis um, low down as possible because remember those grafts when they um, open up when when you, when you fill with blood, the 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 accordion um, the ring will will straighten out. And if your anastomosis is a bit higher, you pull up on the coronary um, artery and have it be under a bit of tension and then. The chances of bleeding are a bit um, higher, so I usually try and place the coronary very low down, um, not too low, so that we can get sutures um, around the mechanical um, valve if we need to, but um, low enough that it doesn't come under tension when the graft um, expands. And then we, the other thing we do is we do it in two layers, and then we put a strip of pericardium around that anastomosis. And that usually helps a lot with uh, preventing, so you don't have to put in extra stitches as uh, time goes on. The distal anastomosis is pretty um, significant, it's pretty standard. Uh, most of the time, if we, if the, um, is the aneurysm that goes, um, or the dissection will do the hemi arch procedure, meaning we'll do an open distal anastomosis under circle rest. But in this case, uh, set arrest is with continuous blood flow to the brain because of our anti-grade um, um, blood, um, blood flow from the axillary artery going up the um, we, we clamp off the brachiocephalic on the on the on the right side. So the, the goes blood goes from the axillary subclavian and up to the carotid um, artery. But people will ask that what's the incidence of stroke? People that not have the um, complete circle of release, but the incidence is for us has been um, not had any strokes, and the literature supports the fact that with the anti-grade anastomosis, um, um, blood flow, the you know, um, stroke is quite limited. And a lot of times you can see the blood coming back from the left carotid, so it lets you know that blood is um, flowing through the um, flowing through the through the brain. The other way to do it. Um, Works as well. I don't. Uh, that's just giving blood through the superior vena cava to as a retro, retrograde source of um, blood flow. But we this works very well for us. We don't have to pull down past 24 degrees. In fact, my main concern with pulling is usually the kidneys. You know, I pull more when I'm more concerned about the, about the kidneys. Um, but 24 degrees usually works well, and you don't have to do the anastomosis in a hurry. You know, because you know that blood flow continually to the to the brain. So, um, not take um, um, time. This is more um, just. Uh, there's nothing re really unusual about this about our technique of um, 
you know, so our, 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 um, the, the, we do the right coronary anastomosis uh, after we um, stretch the graft with blood, and then we can figure out exactly where to put the right uh, coronary artery. So, and, um, so our experience with some um, descending thoracic um, aneurysms, we um, <clears throat> obviously um, these days sensing that's where the endovascular comes in uh, is is a way to go, and we had um, you know I'll talk about our study, what we've done. Um, later, we, but, uh, we've had a couple of cases where uh, we, we, we were not, uh, we had to, one was a ruptured um, descent cross when we, we didn't have a stent, and um, the other one was a patient that had uh, both a descent cross aneurysm, a normal aneurysm in between, and then an abdominal aortic um, aneurysm, which we also did um, open. Um, so this is the um, surgical management for the descending thoracic aneurysms, uh, mostly dissections. Uh, just again, uh, we prefer to do um, a partial um, bypass, a left heart bypass, where we can lace the inferior pulmonary vein and then we can lace the um, femoral artery. And there's also um, the option of cannulating, obviously, the descending thoracic um, aorta. And, um, so we use a generous um, left uh, posterior lateral um, thoracotomy. We notch the fifth rib, uh, or some actually prefer to excise the fifth rib than the SS3 and go through the bed of it. But it's, um, I know a lot of people frown at that, but notch, notch fifth and sixth ribs and have a good um, uh, exposure, or all um, go through the fifth rib and then go through, uh, through the seventh rib for the, um, distal anast anastomosis. So um, the key in the, this, um, what um, we emphasize is making sure that you can see the whole um, circumference of the of the, the lip of the aorta, because remember the esophagus is just um, behind it, so that we there's no um, esophago um, aortic fistula. So we've, we've um, so at our center, um, I think. Between 2015 and 2022, like I said, we don't have like a hundreds of cases. We've had 37 patients present to us. We've operated on um, 31 of these. Um, uh, um, <clears throat> so of the 28 patients had open surgery, um, of, uh, and um, three patients had um, stent grafts um, placed. We had a perioperative mortality of 20%, but we didn't always start with the mini step technique. Since we started, we've done 12 patients with the mini um, step technique, which we lost one of those patients. And the patient was actually a perioperative mortality in the ICU, and was because he had a um, rupture. He ruptured his, he did the ascending, and we wanted to take him back for the ascending, uh, or what do you call it, stent. And the rupture while in the ICU. So, just to um, that's how far we've come. And this technique, we really feel very comfortable doing um, um, aneurysms. So, the, um, we've had uh, the acute type A um, dissections, we really had um, just two of those. Most patients come with aneurysms that have, and have chronic dissections, meaning they come to us after two weeks. So obviously, um, those are those that survived come to us after two weeks. Um, the mortality of type A dissection is within um, 24, 24 hours, 25 percent of people that have a dissection are dead. Within 48 hours, 50 percent of them are dead. So those that come to us most of the time, I don't care. So we just have two people that come to us within two weeks of their. Uh, of their disease. Everybody else has been, you know, they, they just kind of uh, survived. You know, to, I mean, some of them might, so another 25% will have died within uh, two months. So, but then most of the patients we've seen are uh, chronic um, aneurysms or um, chronic dissections. And uh, most um, we've had to do, most of them will have to do the modified Bentol procedures. We don't have any um, valve sparing procedures and we use mechanical valves, like I said. 
So we had um, three um, untable mortalities. Um, one of them was um, a rupture, a free rupture, while it was being induced for um, anesthesia. The other two were um, root bleeding early on in our experience before we started to use the minisket uh, technique. So uh, the two patients I described were sending for us reasons. We lost the patient that had the ruptured um, type B, Stafford type B dissection um, on the table. And um, the other patient that um, had two reasons to fix both of them. And the uh, patient actually came for Botacot. So it's doing very well. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. I'd like to congratulate you <laughs> for uh, your body of work, uh, for your dedication and sacrifice to family. It's been uh, a long journey. Uh, my question is very simple now. Do you have uh, like a referral uh, network set up or system set up with? emergency room or vascular centers, at least a few selected ones, so that when these patients come in, they can be recognized early and then have access to you, kind of like the referral network. Um, we honestly uh, do not have that referral network for, say, um, aneurysms. It's mostly uh, our, so our, our institution, uh, Tri-state healthcare systems, which, by the way, we have a, a agreement with Duchess. I think it's just fair for me to mention that we have uh, to Duchess. Uh, it's not just Tri-state Hospital. We have you know, Duchess. So we, so we know for cardio and classic, and so so um, physicians when they maybe come across somebody that has a dissection or an aneurysm would ask for general comments and can you do this and say. Uh, yes, we can have a doctor set there, but we don't have any like set of um, trial patterns like we would in the US. I think we need to get to that. Um, just, um, I don't know, we're still too busy trying to <laughs> get, get the physics. <laughs> Thanks. The, uh, during the ICP presentation, there was the challenge of blood and blood products. How do you work around it? I'm just curious. Yes, thank you, Bert. That's an awesome question. Yeah, thanks. So, what, um, while I was at Bangkok, we had a, definitely had, there was never a day, well, uh, well, apart from the early, so our first, one of our first cases at Bangkok, um, when we got there in 2015, so it had gone very well, and we're all in the ICU, and the child uh, suddenly coded and found out that the potassium was very high. And then we were getting, um, we didn't have any, we were trying to get blood from outside the city. So when we realized that we didn't have good blood, so then early, very early, we made the decision when we would stay, then we made up, we, we essentially chased our own blood bank, you know, we got our own centrifuge. You know, and, Fridge and we get uh, you know our own donors and I, mean, I don't think there's any kind of the environment there is a university environment with young students so we usually um, always get blood and even now I shouldn't say anything about it <laughs> because when you're in Lagos um, Lagos has stricter rules and we're trying to talk to them about you know, how that we, what we do uses a lot of blood so you, you cannot use all blood. Because of the coagulation factors, and you cannot wait for blood to come from either maternity or wherever. So we're stuck, we're talking to them in Lagos too, so we can have our own proper. Um, so, so blood 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 blood. I get uh, the key was you had your own blood bank. Yes. Yes. One of the things that uh, <laughs> uh, I hear from the last issues here. It's probably that we don't have cell savers. If we're doing big surgeries, having cell savers to get blood return, so the patient's not losing that blood, could be something we could. Uh, so, but for me, um, well, something about cell savers. Um, so, what I, was, I started out with lasso fracture in my previous life, <laughs> and um, we had a cell saver in lasso. 
half the time we couldn't get the consumables or only for the salt saver too. And then one thing with the salt saver is if you don't wash blood well, your your bleeding will increase. So, so we're not in Nigeria. I don't think we're really into cell saver yet. Improve maybe revisit the cell saver issue, especially if you're losing a lot of blood. If you can at least minimize that, then work on the, on the coagulation parameters. I think it makes well, uh, yeah, decrease the blood transfusion while you get on lots of blood. Yeah. Uh, one more question here. So um, you talked about the fact that they present late. Would that be a route for a point of care ultrasound scans and chronic practice and chronic yes. medicine practice to? this case early so that the presentation will not be at the time that they come in. Also, is there any room for maybe PKC to the government for screening purposes, also to get the HMOs to cover screening purposes for men? At, uh, I know that in the US and the UK, there are screening programs to get uh, aortic uh, nearest and so Yes, yeah, so uh, 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 we have an association of cardiothoracic surgeons of Nigeria. So we had a conference in, in March, and this came on that conference. So we part of the, uh, uh, the, the recommendations from that conference. Is, is from Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. So I think we'll stretch our legs a little bit uh, before 12 o'clock. Our next speaker will be coming from London. So let's stretch our legs and uh, get the water or something. And then uh, at 12 o'clock, we'll get started. Well. Okay, thank you so much.
Uh, he has two top topics, and we have uh, a couple of speakers, and we'll have a lunch break, full lunch break, and we start at 1 p.m. So our next speaker is Dr. Das. Um, uh, Dr. Das comes to us from London, is a fellow of the uh, FRCS, and uh, he's a consultant vascular surgeon, does great work in London, and uh, we appreciate his ability to come on virtually today to talk on a couple of great topics, management of uh, vascular injury of the neck and management of penetrating aortic ulcers. Dr. Das. Thank you, Dr. Oi and Dr. Gupta and the organizer for this conference. And thank you particularly for inviting me to speak at this conference. I was listening to some of the talks earlier, and I'm very impressed with the progress that has been made in the resource facilities that is available to uh, deliver cardiothoracic and vascular services in Nigeria, particularly. I must also uh, congratulate that uh, you acquiring your first ultrasound machine. And uh, I recently, about six months ago, donated one Equison 512 ultrasound machine to Uganda General Hospital. So I'm very pleased that I was able to support them in their quest for advanced treatment. So without much further ado, I'm going to start my talks. I will just share my slide so that uh, Now, can you see my slides, please? Yes. Okay. So, about five years ago, here in London, we organized a symposium at the Royal College of Surgeons in England. And the title of the symposium was rapid rise of emergency trauma surgery in London and in the United Kingdom. This was following a spat of a uh, number of uh, stab injury in London itself. And we were looking at the reason behind such problem and how we can prevent and minimize the damage caused by this uh, injury. And uh, we looked at the general trauma in particular, I was interested to look at the injury suffered in the neck. Now, as you can imagine, the neck is a such, a, such a restrictive uh, place. Yeah. Uh, and it is such a restrictive, but it houses so multiple organs starting from the muscles, from the blood vessels, arteries, veins, very important blood vessels indeed, the nerves, the thoracic duct, the nerves, brachial plexus, and spinal cord. And in addition to that also, we have got the glands, various glands they are also occupying in the neck structure. And more than that, the viscerals like esophagus, trachea, they are also prone to damage um, by either knife injury or blunt injury, whatever is the mechanism. When we talk about injury, there are two kinds of injury that we talk about. One is the blunt injury, the other is the penetrating or sharp injuries. The sharp injuries that we see in our practice are mostly due to the knife, razor blades, glass injury, and maybe related to other injury. The projectile injury, however, are mostly handguns, shotguns, and rifles. People also suffer from injuries due to fall from a height, road traffic accident, so on and so forth. But the difference between the stab injury and projectile injury is that with the stab injury or sharp injury, there is a predictable pathway of damage that it can cause to our body, particularly in the neck. And there is also in the neck, when there is a stab injury, there is a higher incidence of subclavian laceration 
in addition to the carotid and other venous injury. But there is a lower incidence of spinal cord injury in this area. So why it is so? Let us look at the mechanism why some of the injuries, particularly with the projectile injury, are sometimes they can be so devastating that uh, we need to understand the principles behind this injury. As you can imagine, the kinetic energy that is produced due to the projectile injury is the mass and the velocity at entry and velocity exit. So higher the mass, that definitely is going to uh, increase the, the insult as well as the velocity of travel of the uh, uh, projectile. Handguns and shotguns are low velocity uh, uh, rifles. Uh, rifles are at higher velocity. So they will cause much more damage. And not only that, higher the muscle velocity or muscle velocity of the fire, firearm, then this causes temporary cavitation effect, which is causes more damage to the area. So this is a principle which you should remember whenever you are dealing with trauma uh, injury. So when we talk about penetrating trauma injury, in the past, we always de de depended upon that this trauma or knife or gunshot injury, has it violated the platysma? The platysma being the covering of the neck, if it is violated, the chances of deeper organs being injured is very high. And not only that, it is only blood vessels, and there will be multiple other structures that would be injured because of this injury. And the mortality in this kind of injury could be very high, particularly when it has violated the platysma uh, in the neck. So before we discuss about the principles behind the management of neck injury, whether it is uh, blunt or knife injury or sharp injury, let us look at the anatomy of the neck. And we know that the anatomy of the neck is divided into anterior triangle, posterior triangle. And more than that, there are three levels that has been identified in the neck, which is the zone one, zone two, and zone three. And this different classification of the zones has got certain uh, need for the management of these injuries in this area. And that is what needs to be understood. In my discussion today, I'm going to mostly discuss about the principles of management of these injuries, not the technique of management. So, so which is the zone one? The zone one starts from the clavicle to the uh, uh, cricoid process. The zone two starts from the cricoid process from the to the angle of mandible, and zone three is from the angle of mandible to the base of skull. Now, as you can see from my slide, these different zones contain different structures. In the zone one, in addition to the subclavian artery, carotid artery and jugular vein, you have got thyroid, esophagus, and uh, trachea and apex of the lungs. In the zone two, again, the carotid artery, jugular vein and esophagus larynx and the various cranial nerves also occupy that area. Whereas in zone three, which is just above the mandible, it is mostly the pharynx, and various other cranial nerves are, and carotid arteries are occupied in this area. So the question is, so which zone is most at risk of suffering injury from whatever the type of injury? In this slide, I'm trying to show you that if you can see the zone two is the <coughs> most vulnerable, most susceptible to injury, to particularly knife injury. And majority of the injury goes through the a zone two, and of course it can go to other zones, particularly towards the subclavian artery to the zone one and injure the proximal subclavian artery or carotid artery, in addition to the other visceral injuries that we discussed. So how often these various structures are injured uh, when there is an injury, particularly neck injury by stab injury? As you will see, mostly it is the top four structures which are largely injured or largely damaged 
during this uh, in, uh, during this uh, type of injury, stab injury particularly, whereas the spinal cord or neurologic injury are less often injured uh, due to this. Now, there are certain uh, important hard signs and soft signs that we have to look for during initial assessment of these patients. Now, although there has been a lot of improvement and uh, reversionary changes that has taken place in our uh, principles of management of injuries or trauma, but certain important principles that we need to remember that we should understand which are the definitive signs that there has been a, a difficult, serious injury to various structures in this person. And at the same time, you should be, we should be aware of the soft signs that are also available, uh, that are also we need to identify, uh, look for. Now, this is important. These clinical features helps us in identifying the type of damage that this patient suffer. In the absence of sophisticated 3D uh, city, uh, city scan to assess these patients at your disposal, you need these kind of things to assess these patients to, in addition to initial assessment and primary resuscitation, you have to think about what for the step that need to be taken in these patients. So this is just an, a, a classification of injury that can take place in the carotid artery. And as you can see, there are five grades of uh, carotid artery injury. In the grade one, that is less than 25% of uh, dissection, or irregularity or injury, and there is also a risk of further progression, and this can cause stroke. Whereas when the dissection or injury is more than 25% luminal stenosis, there is a 70% risk that this could progress. If there is a complete occlusion, as in this picture, there is a risk of stroke in about 50% or less than 50% of the time. And whereas there is a transaction of the carotid artery, there is almost certainly 100% mortality in these patients. Less severe injury, as you can see in this picture, and if you follow this picture, this is the original picture when there was irregularity of the carotid artery, and this has resolved with conservative management. Whereas in this patient where there is multiple irregularity, there is a filling defect, this will need some endovascular treatment or some treatment in order to stabilize the plaque or stabilize the injury. Now, this algorithm of management that I'm showing simply to give you the principles of management, depending upon what resources are available at your disposal. If you are at a, a leading center, terminal, um, uh, uh, very good institution mm -hmm. with availability of CT scan facilities 24 hours a day, you don't need to go through this algorithm. Where you need to do is you need that CT angiogram um, in this kind of injury and proceed with the definitive management of these patients. Of course, you will have to do all the resuscitation procedure as necessary, as according to the ATS or ALS, ATLS or ALS protocol. However, if you are uh, working in a hospital where there is no 24 hour CT scan facilities available, or if you are working in the war zone in a military area where you may not have access to the CT scan, then you have to follow this uh, so-called algorithm and you have to look for what is called platysma violation because that violation of platysma will indicate that there is different injury in these patients and that may need exploration and stabilization of the injury in these patients and then you will follow subsequent whatever you find in these patients then you'll have to treat those con uh, th those damages now, another important principle uh, that has been recognized recently, and uh, what is most important in these patients, where you have to prioritize how to stop the bleeding, and that's why that is this is aided by the ALS and ATLS protocol. You have to stop exsanguination in this patient, whether by compressing on the area where it is bleeding, or by uh, intra, uh, endovascular uh, occlusion, balloon occlusion of the artery, which is the risk uh, which is causing the bleeding, 
this should take the priority over other A, B, C, D, E that was uh, decided according to the previous uh, ATLS protocol. The second thing is that you must or you must try, if you have got at your disposal, a, a endovascular a hybrid suite or endovascular facilities, then use of an intraortic balloon pump, so intraortic balloon that reduces uh, the bleeding and serves the patient. This should be considered what is called the Riboa catheter. Endovascular management of all the vascular injuries need to be done as soon as possible, or if not possible by endovascular means, it needs to be done by open vascular surgery. So these are some of the issues that we need to think about if uh, we are planning to treat these patients. Are we going to do diagnostic neck exploration or we need, a, we need a high quality CT angiogram to understand the severity and the extent of injury. And this has almost certainly had changed the modern management of treatment for these injuries. Secondly, when you are controlling the bleeding, would you consider open surgery or by con uh, endovascular occlusion of the artery to stop the bleeding? By that, you can uh, abolish or eliminate various collateral damage during open surgery that always, almost certainly, you are going to encounter in these patients. Endovascular proximal and distal control is much more easier to perform than to control or have established that control by open surgery. And endovascular treatment is important, particularly when you are trying to do surgery for the soft clavian artery, proximal soft clavian injury, uh, artery, or proximal carotid artery, or distal internal carotid artery, or vertebral artery. Endovascular treatment is vitally important in this patient. Otherwise, the control of bleeding will be very difficult in this patient. Here is the, you are, what you are saying, in the days of open surgery, or even the military area, where you have to do chest, or subclavian exploration, or the neck, or subclavian exploration in order to stabilize the bleeding, which are ghastly, very extensive surgery that can be achieved by simple endovascular means. As in this patient, a subclavian tear has been corrected by an endovascular stain graft, uh, as in this case. So there is a lot of benefit of controlling this bleeding by endovascular means today. So the important thing that we learned from this exercise that zone one and zone three injuries are most difficult to assess control and preferably this should be controlled by endovascular means. The neck houses many vital structure, trachea, esophagus, nerves, blood vessels, and so on and so forth. And if you are in doubt, always intubate as early as possible and get the surgeon or vascular surgeon's uh, attention as quickly as possible. CT angiography remains the test of choice in assessing the vasculature and other structures, um, injury, particularly the esophagus, uh, uh, trachea. And esophageal injury is the worst and that remains silent for a long period of time, and many times it is the cause of mortality in these patients. Clear the C-collar by Nix's criteria at an early stage if possible. Be vigilant and watch this patient closely for further damage, which you might not have seen, which will uh, evolve uh, over the time. Thank you. Any questions so far for Dr. Das before he moves on to his next talk? It's a question. It's a question. Uh, Dr. Carey has a, a question. Are you there, Dr. Carey? Yes. Oh, sorry, I'm here. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. What's your question for Dr. Das? Go ahead. Are you there, Dr. Carey? I guess we lost him. We lost him. Okay. Well, we'll ask the question at the, at the conclusion of the next talk. Dr. Das, go ahead. We'll get the question back to you at the, at the beginning of the next talk. Or the, okay. At the end of the next talk, right? Okay. 
Thank okay, you. Okay. Okay. Let me uh, get the next uh, slide. Yeah. Can you see my slides, please? Yes, yes. OK, thank you again. Uh, I'm moving on to the next topic, and this is what we call as penetrating aortic ulcer or PAL. Now, this is a subject which uh, we don't discuss very often, and this is a byproduct of our discussion at our X-ray MDT meeting when we have been trying to understand the CT scan findings of an aneurysms or dissection or so on and so forth. And this is a incidental finding on the CT scan that we come across. So what is the penetrating aortic ulcer? This is a pathology that involves the aortic wall along with aortic dissection and aortic intramural hematoma. This forms a spectrum of disease known as acute aortic syndrome. And as I said, that many times we see incidentally during our discussion at the MDT meeting of a CT angiogram, but these are not as innocent they look like, and therefore there is a need for intervention. The question is, when should we intervene in this patient? So, penetrating aortic ulcer is a chronic condition. It is defined by an ulcer-like disruption of the intima, and that is maturing within the aortic lumen. And this can progress over the years. We will see this in the natural history of this disease subsequently later on. Whereas IMH or intramural hematoma usually presents with a smooth intima, as in this case. You will see there is a smooth intima, but there is a hematoma lining between the intima, media, so on. And this, unlike the penetrating aortic ulcer, usually uh, exists with atherosclerotic disease, systemic atherosclerotic disease, whereas there is a localized disease, which is the IMH or intramural hematoma. But sometimes it may be associated with the penetrating aortic ulcer, where an atherotic ulcer has broken down into the uh, media and has caused hematoma and thickened intima that causes the base of the crater. Stanson et al. accurately described PAL is an ulceration of an atheromatous plaque that disrupts the internal elastic lamina and allows hematoma formation with the media of the aortic wall. So like the Thoracic aortic aneurysm or dissection, this is also uh, classified according to the Divaki type A and type B, and all, or according to the Stanford classification, type 1, type 2, and type 3, A and B. But this is important to know this because this helps us in understanding the principles of management of this very uh, unusual condition. So how common is the uh, this condition in about it's a very common in patients who are elderly above the age of 70 they have got co uh, concomitant hypertension they are smokers and they've got also other atherosclerotic disease particularly coronary disease or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease pow accounts for about 7 to 10% of the patient who present with acute aortic syndrome in about 50% of the cases, there are con concomitant aortic aneurysms, mostly in the thoracic aorta or in the abdominal aorta. So, as I said that this is a part of the atherosclerotic process, maybe sometimes it is systemic or sometimes it is localized, and the risk factors being hypertension and atherosclerosis. 
Some say that there is spontaneous rupture of the vasa vasorum within the media, which then leads on to the development of the IMH. Now, some studies say that 80% of the penetrating aortic ulcer also associated with uh, IMH in hematoma. So in the early stage, this lesion of penetrating aortic ulcer that ulcerated the intima, and they remain asymptomatic for a long time unless it progresses further and becomes deeper and increase in a diameter. Or secondly, it ulcerates into the media and forms the hematoma within that. The power results completely sometimes, remain stable, if, and that remains totally asymptomatic but it can also lead to aortic dissection, aortic circular aneurysm, and sometimes even uh, aortic rupture. Now, which is the commonest site of this uh, condition? Thoracic aorta is involved in about 60% of the time of a penetrating aortic ulcer or IMH. So also the abdominal aorta is involved in about 30% of these cases. And surprisingly, or fortunately, the ascending aorta and arch is only involved in about 7% of the time. Why it is uh, important to know this? Because if you look at the uh, complications and the progress and prognosis of this condition, the prognosis is worse with involvement of the ascending aorta and aortic arch. And therefore, uh, it should be, uh, I will talk about later on, but before that, let us see what are the complications that can happen from this penetrating aortic ulcer. As I said earlier, that there will be transmural aortic rupture. You can have embolic phenomenon, distally, uh, uh, embolizing distal structure. There are pseudo aneurysm formation that can happen, or the power can progress and increase in depth, and this can be at risk of rupture. And if there is concomitant aneurysm, there will be progressive aneurysmal dilatation in some of these patients. So what is the natural history of these conditions? Spontaneous resolution may occur in about 50 to 80 percent of the time, providing we have corrected the various risk factors like smoking, atherosclerosis with appropriate anti-lipid agents, beta blocker, and uh, aggressive control of the blood pressure. These are something which should be taken in into account as a medical management of this patient. And it can uh, uh, result into success, uh, success uh, in treating this patient in about 50 to 80% of the time when they're asymptomatic. They can progress into classic dissection or aneurysm. And when it happens, then there is a mortality about 40% in the proximal aortic dissection or, um, um, or distal when it happened uh, occupy the abdominal aorta, the, the, the risk is lower than if it affects the proximal uh, segment. The normal aortic diameter, uh, diameter is a predictor of IMH. If there is a normal aortic diameter in addition to the IMH, then the prognosis is better. But if it is more than four to five centimeter in diameter, or the IMH is thicker, more than 10, centi uh, 10 millimeter, one centimeter in thickness, then the risk also increases in this patient. With regard to the risk and uh, prognosis, type A, when it involves the ascending aorta, the risk of rupture is very high, about 33 to 40%. So therefore, whenever there is a uh, type A, when it's treating aortic ulcer, this should be repaired as early as possible, as urgently as possible. Otherwise, there is always a risk of rupture and death. Type A intramural hematoma, again, the similar risk as the penetrating aortic ulcer, and this should receive urgent uh, early treatment for this condition. Whereas type B penetrating aortic ulcer or intramural hematoma, they have also got bad prognosis because of uh, the risk of rupture as well as the risk of treatment fa treatment failure and the risk of the treatment itself. Other poor prognostic indicators in this patient when the patients are above the age of 70 
or they have got, as I said, they've got concomitant aortic ulcer as well as intramural hematoma. Or if the aortic diameter is more than 40 millimeter or the th thickness of the interior media is more than 10 millimeter. So how do we manage in these patients? If it is symptomatic and there is symptoms and acute aortic syndrome, the risk of PAL is in about 70% of these patients. Sometimes these patients may have periaortic hematoma, uh, pleural effusion, and that is an indication by itself for emergency surgery in this patient. Patients who are asymptomatic and usually they're diagnosed incidentally. And in these cases, treatment involves mostly aggressive medical treatment to control the risk and the prognosis in that can be better. The investigation of choice in all these patients, usually the CT and geogram to begin with, and this might follow with IVUS or um, uh, transesophageal echo to guide us for the treatment if necessary. And again, as I said earlier, that asymptomatic patients, we can have a better prognosis if we are aggressive in our medical management with regard to hypertension control, beta blocker, antiplatelets, statins, and pain control. This patient, we can achieve very good result in these patients with aggressive medical management of these patients. Whereas if the patients are symptomatic with acute aortic syndrome, chest pain, and uh, all the complications that I alluded to earlier, then if it is ascending aortic involvement, surgical repair is a must. If it is descending aorta, then surgical repair is necessary Nowadays, with endovascular development, we can consider endovascular repair of these patients, whether it is ascending aorta or descending thoracic aorta. There is, of course, going to be a high risk of spinal cord ischemia following these procedures that we should be mindful of. Many centers say that there is no set guidelines when to treat and practice varies uh, uh, from one hospital to another center. But I think it is uh, the principle of choice is this, that if the ascending aorta is involved, then urgent early uh, intervention is recommended, whether it is endovascular or open surgery. If it is descending aorta, but asymptomatic, then aggressive medical therapy, as I described earlier, with clinical and radiographic follow-up. This is important. We must do radiographic follow-up in this patient. I will show you in my subsequent slide how radiographic follow-up is so important in managing this patient. So there should be an annual CT scan follow-up in this patient. If they are symptomatic or signs of progression, then or if the penetrating aortic ulcer the depth of the penetrating ulcer is more than two centimeters or diameter is more than two centimeters. This is an indication of early surgery in these patients. Or if they have a complicated, like pulse aneurysm, and this would be also treated by surgically or endovascular means as soon as possible. <clears throat> so this is the uh, slides of follow up of these patients. On the left side, you are seeing the original condition, and on the right side, or the follow-up during this period, you can see how this follow-up here has increased in size due to, due to the follow-up with the regular CT scan. So CT scan follow-up remains a vital uh, imaging modality in this patient, and uh, uh, revising your uh, treatment whether you should continue with medical treatment or you should consider early aggressive surgical treatment in these patients. So finally, as I said, with intensive medical therapy, the prognosis is good. And 90% of the patient, if the medical therapy is successful, will survive at five years. Surgical group always or endovascular treatment also will have a higher risk endovascular treatment of thoracic aorta or aortic arts is uh, highly riskful, but they're effective. And 70% of this patient may survive if the original treatment, initial treatment has been successful. And we should always think about endovascular surgery in this treatment, avoiding open surgery if possible.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Das. Any question from the audience? Yes. I hope I have a question from Dr. Gorgi. Okay, Dr. Gorgi. Thank you, Dr. Das, for the presentation. Uh, I, I, I'm just uh, going to ask this question about screening, given that um, the outcome could be very good for patients that are picked especially in symptomatic stage. Uh, what what screening tool uh, would you recommend for us living in this uh, part of our world? Okay, I mean, as I said, the the incidence of these aneurysms is less than seven percent penetrating aortic ulcer, and majority of the time it is um, revealed by as an incidental finding while we are discussing in our MDT meeting of a CT angiogram performed for other reasons like aneurysms or whatever else. And therefore a screening program will not be uh, economically uh, effective or um, be very choice because the other reason is the main uh, way of screening will be by CT scan and you cannot subject patient to CT scan regularly or frequently because of the risk of radiation and so on. So unfortunately, to answer your question, we do not have a proper um, uh, tool to non-invasively uh, do repeated testing in this patient as a for screening uh, procedure. Okay, thank you. I got it. Yeah. There's one more question for you, Dr. Dax. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you. A couple more questions. Thank you, Dr. Das, for the interesting lectures. Uh, my question is actually on the first lecture. Uh, during my residency in, here in Nigeria, we had uh, quite a number of uh, stab injuries in the neck. And what we actually found uh, more challenging to manage were the uh, jugular venous injuries. Surprisingly, the carotid artery injuries and injuries to other structures we were able to deal with. But I remember one patient in particular we uh, lost on the table, basically exsanguinated from a uh, very large uh, venous injury. Just wondering if you uh, have any advice that, uh, for that kind of situation. So you said that you lost the patient because there was continuing exsanguination from carotid artery injury. Is that correct? Well, jugular vein, internal jugular vein. Internal jugular, internal, jugular, vein internal jugular vein. Well, the internal jugular vein, usually you can stop by compressing on the neck until you are able to explore and ligate it because you can ligate safely the internal jugular vein. But as I said earlier that it is very difficult in that area where in the neck to have control proximally or distally in this patient. And that is why endovascular occlusion of these vessels is important if we can do that, or if you have got the resources available locally, that will be the best way of dealing with these patients. Otherwise, unless you can occlude the proximal source of bleeding, unless you can occlude the distal source of bleeding, um, then it is difficult. You have to check your chance exploring the neck and ligating the vein that is available uh, at your disposal. Okay. We have one more question for you, Dr. Dams. Sure. Thanks for your, thanks for your um, talk, Dr. Dams. My question is actually maybe um, a state beyond the penetrating uh, PAU. It's more uh, uh, type B, it's standard type B dissection with a retrograde progression um, towards the ascending aorta. Um, would you, um, how likely, what, what would your preferred um, treatment be? Are you more likely to um, stand that or would you follow the usual criteria and um, for stenting? I mean, the chair is a descending aorta, but there's retrograde um, progression towards the ascending aorta. Yes, uh, this has been recognized quite often. We see this happening every now and then. Now, the, the advice here is, or the choice is, 
that you must assess the aorta where you are planning to do your stent graft. Your stent uh, must be in a normal intima, normal aortic area. You cannot afford to put your stent on the atherosclerotic ulcer. Or sometimes we think that it's a normal area where the pulse uh, uh, sac, pulse aneurysmal sac has thrombosed and the intima over it is thin and you are putting your, deploying your stand there, there it makes a tear and there is retrograde dissection of the aorta. We should avoid such thing to happen because this is catastrophic. And in order to do that, your assessment should be very thorough and even including you might have to do the IVAS or proper good quality uh, high definition CT angiogram where you can see the prop, uh, normal aortic intima, normal aortic wall. If you need to uh, uh, occlude the subclavian artery, so be it. You can occlude the subclavian artery. And but important thing is that um, you will uh, you will save from this catastrophic complication that may arise. Okay, very well. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Das, for your help in making uh, giving us this interesting talk. We appreciate your help and look forward to seeing you in the sixth uh, annual Linda Bass Conference for Africa next year. All things being equal. Thank you so much, Dr. Das, always. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Warren. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I want to uh, take a very quick um, report. Um, uh, my report from the next speaker, which uh, would be quick, that's because of the lunch break. And uh, she is a medical student of mine. She'll be talking about unusual complication of aortic femoral bypass, and uh, that's Dr. Sananda Dara. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. As Dr. Oye said, I'll be talking about an unusual complication of aortic femoral bypass. So, sorry. All right. So. I'd like to begin my presentation talking about peripheral arter arterial disease. So PAD is caught, mainly caused by atherosclerosis, can eventually lead to gangrene, uh, gangrene of the tissues below the blockage, and PAD can happen in any blood vessel, but it's more common in legs than the arms. The risk factors for PAD include age, smoking, hypertension, male sex, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and African Americans tend to have an increased risk of PAD. So in terms of presentation of PAD, it really depends on many things. It depends, the severity of symptoms depends on the degree of arterial narrowing, number of arteries affected, activity level of patients. Symptoms can include pain in one or more of the lower extremity muscle groups, atypical pain, pain at rest or with activity, non-healing wounds, ulcers, and gangrene. So in terms of testing for PAD, you can uh, break it down into symptomatic testing and asymptomatic testing. Symptomatic testing includes um, when somebody has pain at rest, tissue loss, gangrene, that's usually diagnostic for PAD and a vascular specialist is consulted. If it's atypical, you usually need to measure the ankle brachial index, ABI. And if the ABI is greater than 1.3 or less than or equal to 0 0.9, then it, it can, you can uh, consult a vascular specialist. And then if it's asymptomatic, you need to look at the risk factors, like um, what their age is, if they have a smoking history um, and they're abnormal or absent pedal pulses, you measure the ABI. And then from that, it'd be diagnostic for PAD. So I'd like to present a case study. This was Dr. Oye's patient. Um, and it's a pretty interesting case study about aortic biformal bypass complications. So the patient details include um, the age, 62-year-old female, past medical history, she has severe PAD, chronic right foot wound, DVT, dyslipidemia, nicotine dependence, bilateral carotid stenosis, past surgical history, cyst removed from ovary, allergies none, family history, hypertension, heart disease, and in terms of her social history, she, she smoked one pack of cigarettes per day since she was 15 years old. So uh, the first admission was in October of last year. She presented with ischemic pain of the bilateral extremities. She had a complete occlusion of the mid to distal abdominal aorta and beaded bilateral superficial femoral arteries with focal areas of stenosis greater than 90%. She had an original attempt at an aorta fem bypass, but the attempt was not successful because she had a retroaortic renal vein. A few days later, she had a right axillary bifemoral bypass. And this uh, is a CTA of um, her abdomen, abdominal aorta. 
Her second admission was a couple of months later in December. She developed a rate for moral pseudoaneurysm of the SFA, as seen in this first picture. She was then treated with balloon angioplasty and stent placement, and the procedure went well. However, she had a third admission um, in March of this year. A few months later, she returned with right groin abscess and abscess over her femoral anastomosis. She had excessive bleeding from the infected right groin through to aneurysm mm -hmm. and required ligation of the axillary bifemoral graft. Over the next few days, she developed increasing pain with demarcation up to the knee. She developed ischemic gangrene of the right leg up to and above the knee and eventually needed a above the knee amputation. And then she also had a fourth admission of, in May 2020, 2022. A few months later, she developed an infection of the right above the knee stump. At that point, a left axillary bifemoral bypass was done as a last attempt to salvage her limb and restore blood to the right side. Left side now remains patent and has good blood flow. So the two techniques discussed in this case study were aortic bifemoral bypass and axillary bifemoral bypass. The aortic bifemoral bypass is a bypass used to uh, bypass the blockage, blood is redirected through a graft made of synthetic material, which is attached to the existing artery. The artificial blood vessel is formed into a Y shape. The single end of the Y is connected to the aorta. The two split ends of the Y are attached below the blocked or narrowed areas of the femoral arteries. It lasts about 10 years and reduces symptoms by over 80% in patients. And then the axillary bifemoral bypass this procedure involves bypassing blocked arteries and rerouting the blood by connecting the axillary artery to the femoral artery in the groin. Benefits patients that have infected aortic grafts and high-risk patients that have comorbidities that could interfere with the correction of atherosclerosis. And this lasts about five years. Um, these are just a sample diagrams of the procedures. And the complication that we occurred in this case study was at the infected graft. So axillofemoral graft failure most often results in limb loss without remedial procedures. Thrombectomy and revision procedures had poor long-term patency rates and salvaged only a minority of grafts despite multiple procedures. Reconstruction by use of an alternative source of inflow, such as the descending thoracic aorta, resulted in better long-term patency rates in patients well enough to tolerate a major reoperative procedure. So in terms of graft management, um, infected graft management techniques include removal of the infected graft, debridement of infected tissues, vascular reconstruction, selected graft preservation with muscle flap coverage, or graft excision with in situ conduit replacement and long-term antibiotic therapy. So in conclusion, it is better to do an aorta femoral bypass when possible over an axillary bifemoral bypass because of the durability. Aorta femoral bypass tends to last between five to 10 years, and axillary bifemoral bypass lasts about six months to five years. In this case, an axillary bifemoral bypass was used instead of an aorta femoral bypass 